I'd like to bring this meeting of the Williamsburg James City County School Board to order. Is there a motion to certify closed session? Ms. Cook? Madam Chair, I certify to the best of each member's knowledge the Williamsburg James City County School Board, while in closed session, discussed only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements as stated in Virginia law, and that only such public matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered. Thank you. And Mr. Dow, a second? A second. Ms. Serza? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Ombi? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Dr. Beers. Ms. Cook. Aye. Mr. Dowell. Aye. Dr. Beers. Okay. Ms. Hummel, would you please um, move that we include our colleagues? I move that we allow Mrs. Cook. Mr. Kelly, Dr. Beers, uh, to attend this meeting via Zoom to be in compliance with the governor's phase two guidelines for all business sectors related to the COVID-19 pandemic. And, uh, A second. Thank you, Mr. Dow. Ms. Serza. Mr. Kelly. Hi. <laughs> Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Cook. I'm sorry, is this approval of the agenda? I didn't hear the motion. No, this was the motion allowing you, Mr. Kelly, and Dr. Beers to attend the meeting via Zoom. I apologize. Aye. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Dowell. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Ms. Ombi. Aye. Ms. Serza, would you take the roll, please? Dr. Beers. Here. Ms. Cook. Here. Mr. Dowell. Here. Ms. Hummel. Here. Mr. Kelly. Here. Mrs. Young. Here. Ms. Ownby. Here. Um, before we move on to item 3.2, approval of the agenda, I did just want to stop for a moment and, and talk about process. So we do have three colleagues who are calling in. So I will, after each item, to round robin to ensure that everyone is able to participate in the conversation. Um, and we do have some citizens who are present. We um, had offered citizens the opportunity to call in and share their feedback um, so that we could maintain social distancing. But I see folks in the audience. So if you need a speaker card, um, folks who called in were allowed one minute. Ms. Serza will hold up a yellow card if you were wanting to speak or if you're just here to listen. Feel free to listen. Okay, moving on to approval of the agenda as presented, item 3.2, Mr. Dowell. Madam Chair, I move to certify and approve that all agenda items for the June 16th, 2020 meeting are necessary to address the COVID-19 disaster or to assure the continuity of government and that the usual procedures cannot be implemented safely or practically. Thank you, Mr. Dow. Thank you, Ms. Hummel. Ms. Serza? Ms. Cook? Aye. Mr. Dowell? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Ombi? Aye. Moving on to item 4.1, announcements and superintendent's report. Dr. Heron. The most, one of the unique years in WJCC schools history. This was not the year our senior class expected in September, but they persevered. And this weekend, we honored their first accompli their accomplishments and resilience with once in a lifetime graduation festivities. Feedback from students and families has been tremendous so far. 
They were especially excited by Thursday's event, a senior procession down Duke of Gloucester Street in Colonial Williamsburg. Many of you were out on site to cheer our students on as they made their way through the historic area in decorated cars. Family members and teachers lined the streets with signs. Horns were honking and students were smiling. It was an incredible day for everyone involved. I want to thank our community partners from the City of Williamsburg and the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation for making the day possible. Many families and students expressed a desire to make the Dog Street procession an annual event. Then, on Friday and Saturday, WJCC Schools Class of 2020 became the first and only students to graduate at Bush Gardens, Williamsburg. The modified ceremonies included videotaped speeches from classmates and school administrators, along with well wishes from the school board and community partners. From there, students walked across the stage one by one in front of their parents. Due to the proximity of families, it was a far more intimate moment than our traditional graduation experiences at Kaplan Arena. Before walking across the stage, students heard a very special performance by the high school bands, orchestras, and choirs. Their rendition of America the Beautiful was inspirational. Let's listen.
graduations. Yep. I don't know about you, but I've touched my heart when I first heard that, and I've listened to it several times at this point uh, in time. Graduations were a wonderful experience this year. I would like to say a special thank you to our students and families for your flexibility and also to our principals and the amazing graduation planning team led by Stephanie Bourgeois. Who's here this evening. They put considerable time and effort into making this a memorable moment for our students. You can see more pictures from the graduation events on the school division's Facebook page and you can watch videos from each of the Bush Gardens ceremonies on our website. Madam Chair, that completes my report for this evening. Thank you, Dr. Heron. And I just have to echo again how phenomenal that piece was. And just for the public to understand that all of the orchestra band and choir students independently um, submitted their individual pieces. And we had faculty who were able to pull it together and create one um, beautiful piece. And so I know my son was a trumpeter and I listened to him play his pieces and I had no idea what the end product would sound like. And so incredible partnership among all three of our high schools and at all levels with our students. And it just, that's what they did over those last eight weeks, those COVID weeks. And so thank you to our related arts and it just really was incredible. Um, I need to get plugged in because I'm dying. And so moving on to item 5.1, I'm oh, sorry, it's in, it's in a different place than in where we've been, sorry, technology issues. Um, so moving on to um, citizens' comments. So as I mentioned earlier, we had folks call in. So I'm going to turn it over to staff who we will listen to those comments. My name is Christian Pascal. I live at 102 Horseshoe Drive in Williamsburg, and I just would like to uh, speak in support of the French program. Uh, my sons uh, have long graduated, but I remember very well the uh, program that uh, my older son received, four years of French. Uh, I was very disappointed when my younger son, who started in seventh grade, uh, had to terminate his French program uh, after four years and never got the six-year program. So I think we need more French rather than less French. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Dana Satkamp. My address is 8135 Fairmont Drive, Williamsburg, Virginia, 23188. And I'm calling because I'm a concerned parent about uh, cuts in the French language program for Tawana Middle School and War Hill High School. Uh, we really feel like this is a valuable class and that French is the only other global language in the world spoken on all, all continents. Uh, and that if, by cutting it out, you're missing it out on an opportunity for our students, in, especially in the middle school, to gain the proficiency they need by the time they finish high school. Um, it's uh, it's just a valuable part of the education program that we really we really feel strongly. We have our our son enrolled. Uh, we, he took French for six months or half a year this year. My name is Carol Sheriff, and I live at two four four George With Lane. I would like to suggest that due to the disruptions caused by COVID nineteen, WJCC temporarily eliminate class rankings in the high schools. The school's already made a prudent decision to allow students to opt to take courses pass-fail, and it seems equally prudent to adopt a complementary policy of eliminating class rankings. It becomes an apples-to-oranges exercise to compare a grade of pass to a letter grade. Moreover, many students abruptly lost the opportunity to improve their grades during the final marking period. Perhaps most importantly, class rankings may disadvantage our students compared to those in other districts that have already eliminated such rankings. In light of all the other uncertainties surrounding college admissions and job prospects because of the pandemic, I hope that we will do all within our power to keep WJCC students on a level playing field with other students throughout the state and the nation. Thank you for your time, consideration, and hard work on behalf of our students. 
Hi, my name is Jessica Levin. I live at 3609 Mallory Place, Williamsburg, 23188. I have a middle schooler and two elementary students, one with an IEP. And um, my request for next year is that the students go at least two days a week, um, put them in cohorts so that you can contact trace should infections occur. Um, maybe one group of kids going Monday, Tuesday with a break on Wednesday for cleaning, another group going Thursday, Friday. Um, and every kid gets a packet and instructions for virtual learning on their second day to complete for the remaining three days. And we need to turn the work in and actually have it looked at because otherwise the kids are not going to be held accountable and they're not going to actually do it. Uh, I think having them in class for those two days, um, we can have some of that accountability to find out if they are doing work at home and what the quality and what the work looks like and where they need help. Hello, Heather Farr, 9316 Ashwood Court, Toanna, Virginia, 23168. Uh, calling to indicate, please don't tamper with the French program at Toano Middle School and Warhill High School. My oldest son just finished AP French to get his uh, Virginia Department of Education by literacy seal. Uh, he's already got college credit then now for, for the AP French. And my daughter, beginning sixth grade in the fall, plans to follow the same path. Uh, we traveled to Canada in December, and my son was able to translate the French signs. French is a global language. Please keep this important program in place. Thank you. Bye-bye. My name is Rebecca Beasley. I'm a parent. My address is 6228 Somerset Lane, Williamsburg, 23188. I'm concerned about the upcoming changes to the French program, specifically at Toano Middle and Warhill High Schools. My daughter, who graduated on Saturday, is planning to double major in journalism and French because of the superior foundational knowledge and fondness for the French language and culture that was instilled by the educators at these schools. I know that you are all aware of the many well-documented benefits of foreign language learning for children, but it is particularly troubling to learn of the potential elimination of French classes at Tawano in light of the discontinuation of the IB program at James River Elementary. The expectations outlined in WJCC's strategic plan for college and career readiness specifically mention expanding world languages. To eliminate French classes at Tawano, which would then negatively affect future Dean Amon, 3432 Colony Mill Road, Tuana, Virginia, 23168. I'm calling to support not to cut lower enrolled French courses at our middle schools and please allow them to run during the transition in order to preserve the program. Uh, my son, Dylan Amon, is a rising sophomore and has been in, involved in the French program since the sixth grade and he would not have been successful or been as far along as he is. Uh, without the program. So we are very thankful for the program in middle school and wish it to continue. Thank you. Bye. Good morning. This is Marie Grappi. I'm a, I'm a parent and an educator. My address is 352 Ironwood Drive, Williamsburg, Virginia, 23185. And I'm, I'm calling because I'm very concerned about uh, the effect of the, the cutting the budget for the, middle, for the French middle school courses. So I, I we really beg you and um, pray you that you will actually support and preserve the French middle school courses and that you actually might con you should consider, please, um, funding uh, these wonderful programs. Because as you all know, um, the, also the uh, AP classes in high school are strongly connected. So they have, the, if you discontinue or uh, and cut the, the funding uh, for the middle school French courses, that would affect, it will have very strong and very serious ramification on the, uh, on the following um, other course, courses in, uh, in high school. So some of the reasons. Uh, Hi, my name is Mike Modest. Uh, currently live at Four Minor Court in Williamsburg. My biggest concern for you guys reopening schools is not so much the virus and the effect um, that it has on the students. It is more so the psychological and social effects that your guys' uh, decisions will have on our kids. My advice is to strongly consider not reopening with such a rigid, um, impersonable, impersonal 
type system that doesn't allow any social interaction or that puts social distancing and masks above um, the social needs of our kids. Our kids need to interact with both adults and other kids in a fashion that doesn't leave them scarred in the future. Appreciate uh, the time to think about this. Uh, yes, my name is Brian Grappe, and my address is 352 Ironwood Drive, Wingsburg, Virginia. And I'm calling to note that I strongly oppose the cutting of funding for the French programs in uh, middle schools and uh, high schools and believe that this would have a terrible effect on uh, students that are trying to study these languages. They're, uh, they're spoken in five continents. And um, we uh, strongly support uh, continuing the program. Um, and then also, for that matter, uh, since I'm on the phone here anyway, we also strongly support the uh, orchestra and oppose any defunding of that for high schools and middle schools. So um, <clears throat> uh, so, so uh, just getting back to French here for a minute, the uh, French is a career asset and is uh, an introduction That was our last public speaker. Um, moving on to proposed agenda items. Item 6.1, VHSL membership applications. Thank you, Madam Chair. This, uh, annually, we bring an authorization for VHSL for, for the board's consideration, and Dr. Murphy's going to present this item this evening. Good evening, Madam Chair, board members, Dr. Heron. Uh, as Dr. Heron just stated, this is an annual requirement um, to bring the authorization for VSHL membership for Jamestown, Lafayette, and War Hills uh, High School. The purpose of the signature is to indicate that each board member approved its school's VHSL membership. The insurance assessment for 2020-21 school year is $550 per student, and the 2021-20, excuse me, 2020-2021 membership fee is $800 plus $35 assessed per each activity. Membership application fees are due at the VHSL office prior to 1 August 2020. Any questions? Ms. Hummel? It, if any of these activities are canceled because of COVID, do we get any money back? Each activity, each year's bill is assessed based on the prior year's activities. So the years that we're paying for now was actually last year. So as you see on the bill, there were no spring sports uh, bill to us this year. So next year's bill will reflect what happens in the fall and spring of next year. Okay, thank you. Are there additional questions? Are there questions from our colleagues who are Zooming in? I have always tried to figure out why all three of the high schools are different, and I've kind of given up on that. It's, I, just, I think it's girls' golf and boys' golf. I, I don't know. So it's all it's all good. It's based on individual membership. So if you look, look at the student membership numbers, it's not necessarily the sport itself. You pay a sport fee, but you also pay a fee per each member. So it's the size of the team as well, sir. I, I, I got it. Thank you. Ms. Cook and Dr. Beers, do you have additional questions for Dr. Murphy? Hearing none, we'll move on to item 6.2, federal programs grant applications. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, each year we present the federal programs grant applications, and uh, this evening Ms. Ford, Director of Elementary Curriculum and Instruction, is here to present the information. Thank you, Ms. Ford. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Heron. Tonight, I am here to present the proposed applications for the federal programs Title I, Title II, Title III, and Title IV grants for the 2020-2021 school year. Title I provides personnel and resources that supplement academic programming and qualifying schools. Title II supports training, preparation, and recruitment of highly qualified teachers and leaders. Title III supports language instruction for students with limited English proficiency, and Title IV, which is also known as the Student Support and Academic Enrichment Grant, provides funds for programs and activities to improve students' academic achievement. 
This information provides the allocation history for our federal programming grants. As you can see, over the past three years, Title I, II, and III grant funds have remained fairly stable. Title IV, the Title IV grant is in its third year of existence. State funding is formula-based and includes several factors, such as enrollment and free and reduced lunch statistics. As with other federal grants, such as the Carl V. Perkins grant, the grants are written with level funding, which uses the previous year's grant allocation as the basis for writing the grant. When the state releases the updated allocation amounts in the fall, we submit amendments to the grants to align them with the exact allocation amounts. I will present information regarding the 2020-2021 Title I grant application. In alignment with statewide educational reform efforts, Title I emphasizes funding for continuous and innovative programming that supplements our work on school improvement goals to meet the needs of all students through effective instructional programs and continued teacher development. Overall, WJCC prioritizes the use of funds for direct services to students. Grant funded positions currently include seven Title I Reading Recovery Literacy Group teachers, nearly 30 part-time reading tutors, one Reading Recovery Summer School position, a Title I Instructional Coach, a Reading Recovery Teacher Leader, a Data Analyst and Administrative Assistant position, and the Elementary Director of Curriculum and Instruction. Remaining grant funds supplement instructional resources, professional development, and family engagement or home resources for our students. The WJCC Title I identified schools will remain the same for the upcoming 2020-21 school year as were identified this year. Lastly, the areas of focus remain consistent with the Title I goals presented on the first slide through the sustained implementation of three main supplemental early literacy interventions. Those interventions are leveled literacy intervention, a small group model, reading recovery, a one-to-one -one model, and successful start, a kindergarten small group classroom model. All three methods emphasize direct teaching, ongoing progress monitoring, the use of formative assessment, and consistent feedback for student growth, all built around high quality, developmentally leveled text. Title I programming also addresses our ongoing professional development and an emphasis on a high level of parental and family engagement. Title II funds support training, preparation, and recruitment of highly qualified teachers and leaders. Title II supports the implementation and support for schools using collaborative teacher teams. Collaborative teacher teams incorporate the following. A cycle that includes selecting a standard and setting a goal, identifying an instructional strategy, grade level or department teams that examine individual student work generated from our common assessments, and collaborative and structured scheduled meetings that focus on the effectiveness of teaching and learning. Additionally, Title II funds address a portion of the salaries for our elementary literacy coordinator, secondary math coordinator, and K-12 science coordinator. Title III funds will be utilized in a manner consistent with the division's initiatives and in alignment with the four pillars of our program, building programmatic, instructional, linguistic, and family engagement capacity. Our Elevation platform is a web-based system that houses all of the programmatic information for our English learners, as well as strategies that content teachers can continue to use to implement sheltered instruction. Newly added this year to Elevation will be a dual language component to provide additional biliteracy support for our native Spanish-speaking students. The Imagine Learning platform is a computer-based suite of instructional experiences that also includes extensive offline intervention tools to facilitate small group instruction. Newly arriving students will continue to receive targeted instructional support that emphasizes foundational language acquisition. We also intend to utilize funds to support our language instruction enrichment program, as well as our L Parent Resource Center. 
Finally, Title IV funds are generally used for increasing technology and enhancing instruction for students through professional development opportunities for educators. The Virginia Department of Education offers the opportunity to transfer Title IV funds into other grant areas. Our team has opted to transfer the funds to the Title III grant to increase technology, enhance instruction, and support family engagement specifically for our growing population of English learners. We anticipate receiving Title IV funds for the coming year and attend, intend to continue to use the allocation to support the expansion of our digital instructional resources, professional learning opportunities, and support for a part-time position for an L Family Engagement Coordinator. I would like to recognize Dr. Pat Tillman, Coordinator for ESL and World Languages, and Ms. Jacqueline McDonald, Coordinator for K-12 Science, for their leadership for the Title II, III, and IV grants. At this time, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Ford. Questions from my colleagues here on the dais? And my colleagues phoning in, Dr. Beers, Ms. Cook, Mr. Kelly. Madam Chair, this is Ms. Cook. I do have a question. Yes. Um, first, I'd like to congratulate Ms. Ford on her new position and thank her for um, so ably presenting this name. Um, and um, I'd also like to say that I'm really uh, most excited about the Family Engagement Coordinator. I'm, I'm really excited to see how that serves our students. Um, and just as a part of um, my uh, understanding of uh, the budget, which we'll talk a little bit later about today, I asked about allocation um, of resources by the building level. And I'm curious if these dollars were, um, were incorporated into that. I don't, Ms. Ford, I'm not, I'm not the one who can answer that, but Dr. Heron, um, do you know if these grant funds were included in that, in that education that you to the border of this add additional dollars at the building level, um, perhaps not equally. Ms. Cook, uh, the federal dollars through the Title I, any of the Title Grants, Title I in particular, were not in the information provided. So each of the Title I identified schools would receive additional funding on top of the information you received and that the whole board received. It, it, would it be possible to get that information at a later date, please? Absolutely, we'll be able to provide that for you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cook. Dr. Beers? Mr. Kelly? I have, I have nothing. I just want to thank, um, thank Mrs. It. Ford for, Ms. Ford for the, for the uh, presentation. Of, well, very well done. Thank you. Dr. Beers, I'm sorry. Did I cut you off? No, no, I, I'm. Uh, um, it's always I'm always interested in um, how we uh, pursue funds uh, up at the Fed level and and, and also in the state. So I, I applaud those who really because I know these are uh, a lot of it's boilerplate, but I but I know you, somebody has to sit down and um, pull the pull this information together and write the grant. So uh, I appreciate the efforts. Um, that uh, uh, staff have made in getting these all done. Thank you, Dr. Beers. Thank you, Ms. Ford. I just wanted to um, echo great job. And uh, I, too, like Ms. Cook, am particularly excited about the L Family Coordinator because I know um, we had great success last year, I believe, at James Blair um, with a family night for L families. And I think 100%, there was 100% participation, and that was really all um, because of the family coordinator, which was a halftime position. So just think of what we can do. So um, unless there are additional comments, I'm going to move on to the next. Thank you. Thank you. Action item. Thank you again. Okay, um, item 6.3, purchase uh, request for laptops, insurance, and services for student use services. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Landers is going to present uh, our information on the expansion of student devices. Thank you, Mr. Landers. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Heron. Uh, this agenda item is to ask your approval of purchasing student use laptops, tablets, insurance, and services in an expansion of our one-to-one -one program to support online and blended instruction for every student. The purchase request will provide 534 high school and 533 elementary laptops, 
1,600 elementary tablets, as well as insurance and extended services for our existing inventory for a total purchase price of $1,749,959. The purchase will be made using the state contract with Lenovo, and the funds are being provided from the CARES Act through James City County. Thank you, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Landers. My colleagues here on the dais, Mr. Dow. I just want to confirm. I just want to confirm that this gets us uh, to that complete one-to-one -one yes, picture sir. that we're looking for. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dow. Uh, Mr. Kelly. Uh, no, I just want to thank for the presentation and uh, also for the uh, county passing these dollars on through to us. Absolutely. Dr. Beers. Ms. Cook? Yeah, Madam Chair, I'd just like to uh, echo Mr. Kelly's thanks to the county for um, wouldn't be able to do this without them. So, and uh, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Landers, I would just like to echo the same thing that my colleagues have said, and thank you to the city um, most definitely and it's, it's exciting to know that we're not just third grade through 12th grade but it's it's K through 12th grade we'll have access to one-to-one -one. so that's that's huge so. absolutely yes ma'am thank you very much Mr. thank Rangers. you okay moving on to item 6.4 award a contract for invitation for bid number 20-14705 site work for classroom trailers at Stonehouse Elementary and Jamestown High School Mr. Snipes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Snipes is here to present this item this evening. Good evening, Madam Chair, school board members, and Dr. Heron. Tonight's agenda item is the award of a contract for invitation for bid for the site work at cl um, classroom trailers at Stonehouse Elementary. Um, as you recall, the school board approved the Stonehouse Elementary and Jamestown High School um, trailers in April of 2020. Uh, the trailers are expected to be in use at Jamestown and Stonehouse until 2023-2024. The work under the project will consist of site work that, of the installation of the two trailers. That will include erosion and sediment measures, decks and steps, concrete sidewalks, electrical connections, fire alarm connections, um, grading and seating. Um, an invitation for bid was issued on May 15th of 2020 with a due date of June 8th. The IFB was returned. The operating budget for, for the site work and for the trailers is $250,000 and you will receive that information shortly after. Questions or comments? Uh, Ms. Ms. Cook? Um, yeah, uh, Madam Chair, no, I have, uh, I have no comments. Um, thank you. Mr. Kelly? So uh, these trailers are necessary for to relieve overcrowding at uh, James Hines Stonehouse? That's correct, sir. And so uh, is, what will be the consequence of um, not approving these trailers this evening? Um, basically, we would be in the same position as, as we've been in for several years with uh, significant overcrowding at the school. Um, however, instruction will go on as normal either way. Okay, I, I, I do believe these trailers are necessary and I'm, and I'm ready to support them tonight. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Dr. Beers, comments or questions? Uh, I, um, uh, I, I support uh, the funding for these trailers. I, I know that some people are not really crazy about them, but that, um, I, I think they're, they're temporary and they really uh, do uh, help with the uh, overcrowding of classrooms. So I very much support this. Thank you, Dr. Beers. And then, Mr. Snipes, just to make it clear, these will be installed and fully functional for the upcoming school year? That is correct. And how many classrooms does that? It will be four, a total of four classrooms. At each site? Two at each site. Two at each site. Okay. Well? Yes, I, as you know, I voted against this at the last time. I just have a question about funding. Has this been, um, I guess my direct my question uh, to Ms. Ewing or to uh, Dr. Heron, is this, have we been granted the funds to be able to do this? The funding is included in the fiscal year 21 budget currently, which you will be voting on tonight. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Snipes. Moving on to item 6.5, revise, recode, and rename policy JFCJ, possession or use of weapons prohibited to JFCD, weapons in school. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Bourgeois is joining me at the table over to my right as she's got several policies and the student code of conduct, and she will take it over from here. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Heron. This policy was originally brought before you in March with no revisions to policy wording. Upon further review, division staff requested the policy be delayed, and it comes before you tonight with the recommendation to rename, revise, and recode to JFCD Weapons in Schools. The revision can be found on lines 14 through 19 of the redlined version. We recommend revising the wording regarding expulsion recommendations to allow principals the ability to make recommendations other than expulsion if special circumstances exist. This does not apply to firearms, but will provide some flexibility with items such as small knives but are greater than three inches. The, re the wording recommendation is the student must be recommended for expulsion by the principal unless the principal determines that based on the facts of the particular case that special circumstances exist and another disciplinary action is appropriate. If the principal recommends expulsion, the superintendent or designee is authorized to conduct a preliminary review of such cases to determine whether disciplinary action other than expulsion is appropriate. There is no, um, I'm sorry, um, this does match the, the wording in our alcohol and drugs policy that provides the same consideration. If questions for Ms. Bushball? Madam Chair, this is Kira. Um, uh, if there's without, is there a way to help us understand a situation in which um, expulsion might not be appropriate? Uh, we, we have had numerous situations over the years where um, a student might have been, say for instance, camping with the Boy Scouts and um, left a knife in his backpack that he used in camping. Um, and if the blade is over three inches at all, and we've had them be like three and a quarter inches. Um, at this time, the only uh, choice for the school administration is to recommend expulsion. Uh, and we just think that there are times where, where consideration can be given to the facts of the case. Thank you. Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Kelly. Um, Ms. Bourgeois, you said that it does not apply to a firearm, but I don't believe that's what the words say. And, and so I just, I think we might want to, I think that needs to be cleaned up a little bit because it says possessors of a firearm or, or other weapon or device prohibited by section must be, which must be except for the other thing. I just don't think the words, the, the words don't say that a firearm is not included in that. So further Am down at, right? at lines 25 through 27, it reinforces that it must be a recommendation of expulsion for a firearm and it lists the definitions of the firearms. It says the following weapons on school property or at school sponsored events require an automatic recommendation for expulsion and it provides the definitions of what expulsion must be recommended for. Okay. I just that's just it seems to me that's in conflict with uh, line twelve through uh, seventeen. And I, I don't know how to fix it right now, but that's just that just seems that that's um, I think those those two sentences are in conflict. I think it's because that it's all inclusive and it says other weapon or device prohibited on line 13 and therefore it's all inclusive. That's why the attorney recommended we place it there um, and then it's further defined later on what doesn't count for that what's not included in that consideration. So if the principal does not recommend suspension, does there any re is there any obligation on the principal to report to administration? It doesn't measurement expulsion, sorry. Is there any, any um, does the principal have to report it to administration? It still does have to be reported, yes. 
Okay. Does it say that here Thank you. in the policy? It's in the code of conduct. In the code of conduct. I was looking for that in the policy. Mr. Kelly, did Ms. Bourgeois satisfy your questions? Um, sure. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Dr. Beers? Uh, I fully support that. Uh, I was involved in the discussion um, when this was being uh, considered, and I, I, I do think that there uh, are occasions where something uh, less drastic than suspension or explosion are appropriate. Are there any additional comments or feedback? Ms. Cook, did you have comments? No. Okay. Moving on to the next item, 6.6, .6, revise and rename policy JFC areas of offense and their definitions to student conduct. Tonight I'll be reviewing a number of recommended revisions for policy JFC. The first revision is the policy title, renaming it from areas of offense and their definitions to student conduct. As you know, policy JFC establishes the expectations for student behavior in WJCC schools. Typically, the revisions are succinct enough to include the explanation in the Code of Conduct presentation. Due to the number of revisions this year, the information will be provided in detail during this presentation and summarized as part of the Student Code of Conduct presentation. The Code of Conduct Committee focused their work this year on aligning our policy with the revised state guidelines for a positive and preventative student code of conduct. In future years, our reporting to the state will categorize infractions into one of five categories. The categories are a means to group behaviors in order to apply leveled responses to those student behaviors. The categories also emphasize the importance of helping students achieve academically and develop social emotional competencies. Five categories are, the first one is behaviors that impede academic progress, and that would be behaviors such as class cutting or cheating. Uh, the second one is behaviors related to school operations, such as not following directions or inappropriate use of electronics. The third category is relationship behaviors, such as bullying, cyberbullying, or inappropriate language. The fourth category involves behaviors that present a safety concern, such as bus violations, possession of alcohol, or sexual harassment. And the last category includes behaviors that endanger self or others, such as assault and battery, being under the influence, or the distribution of alcohol and drugs. Moving into the policy itself, within the introductory section of the policy, on lines 31 through 41, you will find two paragraphs that have been added. The first paragraph addresses the mandatory reporting requirements, which have been added um, also to the Student Code of Conduct. This addition will be referenced in Agenda Item 6.08 regarding Policy JGD. The second paragraph has been added to clearly identify the parameters of the expectations established by JFC to include any school at division activity, no matter the location. Due to the number of revisions within policy JFC, and in order to allow the board to follow along with the proposed policy document, the next slides will follow the alphabetical order of the rules, and line numbers will be provided for reference. Rules that had only minor revision of wording may not be specifically referenced. We'll begin on lines 43 to 45 regarding aggravated sexual battery. This is being deleted. It's not included in the state reporting categories, and it can be covered under sexual assault. Um, this legal violation was reviewed with our SRO supervisor, uh, and he, we discussed any of the ones that might have a legal aspect to it. On lines 90 to 95, the rule titles have been changed from altercation to aggression. Again, this was done to align with the state wording in the categories. And as we continue to move through the revisions, any rule title change that's being recommended is for that reason, to better align it with the state reporting categories. On lines 98 and 99, you will see that arson has been renamed to fire-related, and it's been moved to its appropriate place alphabetically. 
On lines 102 through 106, we've resi revised assault and battery. It now includes the specific <coughs> definition for assault and for battery. And it also includes bullying that leads to physical injury. On lines 108 and 109, we have deleted assault with a firearm or other weapon. It's not included in the state reporting categories, and that can fall under assault and battery and weapons. On lines 111 through 117, attendance has been revised to include failing to attend school or report to class without a legitimate excuse. Again, that's some wording from the state guidelines. On lines 123 through 131, bullying and cyberbullying have been revised to include the state definition of bullying, which is bullying means any aggressive and unwanted behavior that is intended to harm, intimidate, or humiliate the victim involves a real or perceived power imbalance between the aggressor or aggressors and victim and is repeated over time or causes severe emotional trauma. Wording was also added for both bullying and cyberbullying to say this includes bullying behavior that, is continu that continues after interventions. On lines 146 and 147, burglary has been deleted. It will be addressed under stealing, which is the state reporting category. On lines 153 through 157, cheating or plagiarism has been renamed to scholastic dishonesty, and it will now be found on lines 282 through 286, so we'll get there. Um, lying and falsification has been renamed to dishonesty, and therefore was moved alphabetically to lines 163 to 165. Disrespect on lines 167 to 170 was revised to include wording to align with the state reporting categories which includes speaking or acting towards another person in an uncivil, discourteous, disrespectful, or insulting manner, or treating staff or other students with contempt or rudeness. On lines 172 to 180, disruption was revised, again, to line with categories and to provide the specific terms from the state guidelines, which include talking, excessive noise, off-task behavior, out of seat, possessing items that distract, interrupting a class, engaging in reckless behavior, and it also includes inciting a substantial disruption. Horse playing and insubordination were deleted as the committee felt that the examples added provide more specificity for student understanding. On lines 180 to 182 for dress code, it has been revised to delete subjective wording. On lines 189 to 219, electronic devices, inappropriate use, it's been revised to delete outdated references such as pagers and beepers and add more current examples. Um, it's all, we've also moved the technology misuse wording to this rule to align with the state reporting categories. On lines 221 through 223, extortion was deleted. It is not identified as a state reporting category. Um, and as part of this process, the committee identified a number of rules that this type of behavior can fall under to include stealing, bullying, and even potentially assault and battery. On lines 229 through 233, fire related, we discussed the renaming, but it's also been revised to clearly delineate the inclusion of an intent to set fire or to attempt to set fire. And it also adds any behavior that produces a large amount of smoke. For harassment and discrimination, <clears throat> excuse me, on lines 244 through 248, that's been revised um, based on input from our legal counsel to reflect the definition that is found in policy JB, non-discrimination, equal educational opportunities, so that they align and they are consistent. Hazing on lines 250 through 259 has been revised to reflect the legal definition and incorporate all protected groups. On lines 261 through 265, inappropriate language, gestures, or literature we ha has been revised to add gestures to the title and also added swearing, cursing, hate speech, gang signs, or gestures to the definition. The next two rules that we're going to discuss are examples of legal violations which are not included in the state reporting categories. The committee did identify categories that do fit these actions, and they're both examples of student behaviors where at times we may code it under more than one rule of violation. The first one is malicious wounding on 270 to 272. It is being deleted. There's no state reporting category. 
behaviors of this nature will fall under assault and battery, harassment, and weapons if one is used in the incident. Police notification will always occur. Robbery, 278 to 280 is deleted. Taking of items will be covered under stealing. Use of force is covered by assault and battery and weapons if one is used, and again, it would be reported. Sexual assault on lines 288 to 290 is revised to use clear, specific language, um, which includes physical aggression and or facing another to engage in sexual activity. Sexual harassment on lines 292 to 298 has been revised again to use the definition found in our policy, JBCC, Sexual Harassment Complaint Policy, to align and provide consistency. On lines 306 through 308, technology misuse has been deleted to avoid duplication with the electronic device's inappropriate use rule. On lines 310 through 313, stalking, this is our only new rule. It was added to address a state reporting category that's not been previously included in our policy. On lines 315 through 319, we, Theft has been renamed to stealing. It addresses the taking of anything without the consent of the owner, and it includes both with or without the use of force or weapons. <coughs> this again aligns with the revised state reporting categories. Threats on lines 321 through 326 has been revised to include cyberbullying threats. And weapons on 351 to 398 has been We've added the wording that we just discussed in the policy revision because that is actually our policy wording for the weapons <coughs> rule. I want to take this opportunity to thank Mrs. Swinton and the committee members for their commitment to thoroughly discussing each revision prior to recommending the changes presented to you. They were purposeful in their discussion and the result is an aligned tool that is presented in a manner that is understandable to our students and families. I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you, Ms. Bourgeois. Questions from the dais? Questions from me, but thank you. That is a lot of work. I can imagine <laughs> all that went into that. Thanks to our policy thank committee you. as well. They really yeah. were very purposeful. Thank you very much. I just had a question about burglary. Does that fall under stealing now? It does. <coughs> it does. Ms. Cook, do you have questions or comments? No, ma'am. Mr. Kelly? Uh, just, a, just a comment. I know it's, I know it's always challenging put this, putting this together because, um, you know, you'd think these definitions wouldn't change from year to year, but they always seem to, and then we're always up against the timeline to, to get this and the code of conduct out so that we can, uh, we can, um, you know, get it out for our students in the, in the fall. But, uh, it's just, uh, it's just strange to me that these, these definitions always keep changing. So, but, uh, I do. I, I want to thank uh, Ms. Bourgeois and her team for putting this together and obviously putting a lot of thought into it. Thanks. So this year was much more extensive because of the revised guidelines from the state. The guidelines are probably 110 pages long. Um, the way they've formatted it is in a chart format by the five categories. Uh, we spent a lot of time looking at that. We did not feel that it was family friendly because um, something like attendance could be across three of those categories I described to you. So it would be difficult to find. So we've actually crosswalked it all, and in crosswalking it all, we wanted to make sure we covered the intent of all the different pieces of each category, and that did lead to a lot of rewording. Yeah, it, it, it definitely seems that way. These, these, uh, these changes here are, you know, during my tenure, somewhat, un somewhat unprecedented. Agreed. Dr. Beers, do you have comments or questions? Uh, no, I, I, I peripherally uh, watched um, how this was put together, and I, and I really must say that um, the folks who spent all that time going over all this vocabulary and, and coming up with a document that I, that I think is uh, far more um, uh, user friendly than, than the way the state of lay things out. <clears throat> it's really good. And uh, I think um, the other, the, I think the other thing is spelling things out really clearly makes it clear students and parents um, what, uh, what the, what the kind of student behavior, student conduct uh, we expect in our schools and what will happen 
if we don't see it. So I um, high praise to everybody that worked on this. Thank you, Dr. Beers. Ms. Bourgeois, I would echo uh, Dr. Beers' comments, and it is important for our families to be able to read it and understand it and make sense, as well as our students. I, I am wondering, though, thinking about our students with disabilities, who because of their disability, they might um, have some acting out or behavior could be perceived as disruptive or talking. Um, and, and so I'm just curious how, how this aligns with a child's IEP and identified disability. If, well, and it really aligns with the MTSS piece, too, in that Tier 1, where we really look at the behaviors of all students and we, we identify what the function of that behavior is, and, and, and that helps us identify how to respond. And for a student with a disability where behavior may be a function of communication, for instance, then that's going to be handled very differently. Um, and so that's where we work with the teachers. That becomes a training piece as much as anything. Um, and there is a, a, a large training component that's going to go with this for teachers and administrators as we roll this out. That sounds great. And then I'm just wondering, how, how do we, if, particularly for first-time families, um, a, a family who is having a kindergarten, kindergartner starts school and the child has a disability and they read this, that it might be kind of scary. <laughs> If, if their child has some of these behaviors even at home. So how do we communicate to families that, yes, this is, this is the expectation, but there are these other pieces? Well, I think when we get to the code of conduct, you know, most of our rules have a very wide range of leveled responses to behavior, too. And the majority of the, the, the responses in our, our level one are working with families and doing conferences and giving students a chance to think about their behavior and being able to reflect with them. Um, so I, th I think some of that is embedded. Um, our teachers do go through this with families at the beginning of the year, and that includes our special education teachers with their children, and obviously they're going to adapt their explanations. Um, we do try to word this as much as possible, that it's appropriate K-12. It's, it's hard with some of the definitions we have to include, um, but, but we try very hard to make sure that we, we are thorough, as, as thorough and thoughtful as possible in that. Thank you. And I know this was extensive, so thank you so much for your work on that. Um, I'll move on to the next item, which is 6.7, Retire Policy, JGE, Parent Responsibilities and Involvement. So this policy was initially brought before the Policy Committee in February. A question was asked regarding where this information would be provided to parents. Um, so we took it back um, and reviewed it with the attorney. Uh, the attorney felt that um, what was currently stated in our parent responsibility section in the student code of conduct was sufficient um, since the code is approved by the board. Um, however, in order to strengthen its presence, the parent responsibilities page has been revised to include wording, the following wording. As a parent, you are your child's first teacher and can help to provide positive options for your child when situations arise at school. The Williamsburg James City County School Board is required by law to provide parents notice of 16.1-241.2 and 22.1-279.3 of the Code of Virginia, which address parental responsibility and involvement requirements to support an atmosphere of individual rights and free of disruption and threat to persons or property. So we've included that to just strengthen. I mean, the, the, the page is really very parent friendly here are your rights, here are your responsibilities, but we did include this just to make it very specifically covered. Thank you. Your comments, Ms. Hummel? I just wanted to thank you for doing that because I, I think whenever we retire a policy, uh, we want to make sure we don't lose the essence of what the original intent of the policy was. Welcome. Mr. Dowell and Ms. Young? No, not exactly. I, I just don't see a copy of it on here. Is Do we have a copy of the, the new wording? It's being, this one's being recommended for retirement. The wording oh, I, is in I the code. I understand that, but okay, but you, okay. The, the wording I just shared is in the code of conduct. So okay. you will see that it, when we get to that agenda. Okay, it's coming. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's coming. And then Ms. Cook? No, ma'am. Dr. Beers? No, I'm, I'm fine. No and comment. Ma thank you. And Mr. Kelly? No, thanks. I'm good. Okay. Moving on to 6.8, retire JGD student discipline reports of certain acts to parents, school officials, and police. 
Again, this policy was initially brought before the policy committee in February, and prior to the presentation to the board, a question was asked regarding the requirement of subsection E of 22.1-279.3-1, which states, uh, which states a statement providing a procedure and the purpose for the requirement of this section shall be included in school board policies. Um, this is our current policy. There is no matching BSBA policy. Um, so what we have done is taken the code requirements and the eight categories which require mandatory reporting, and they've also been added to the student code of conduct under the heading mandatory reporting to law enforcement. Uh, and we've included the eight categories. Worded is also included in the policy revision for JFC um, to address the notification requirement. It says, in addition, the principal shall make any required <coughs> report to the superintendent, to law enforcement, and to the parent pursuant to Virginia Code 22.1-279.3-1. Principals will also report any acts that may constitute a criminal <coughs> offense to the parents of any minor student who is the specific object of the offense, and that the parents may contact law enforcement for further information. Thank so you. So we've covered it in two places. That's questions from uh, Thank you for making that adjustment. I appreciate it. You're down. Right, thank you. And my colleagues on the phone, questions, comments for Ms. Bourgeois? Ma'am. Nothing from me, thanks. Dr. Beers? No, I'm good. Okay. <clears throat> All right, moving on to 6.9, the 2020-2021 uh, uh, Student Code of Conduct. So all of that should make this fairly easy. Uh, each spring, the Department of Student Services brings for your review the proposed revisions to the Student Code of Conduct. The recommendations being presented tonight are the work of the Code of Conduct Committee, which was led by Anita Swinton, and their work included all of those revisions to Policy JFC. So this is the committee that worked on that. Due to the focus on aligning our rules, and that really was our focus this year, and level responses to the new state guidelines, this year's committee was a smaller strategic group of assistant principals from all three levels. These individuals were chosen to participate based, based on their thoughtful, developmentally appropriate, and thorough daily applications of our code of conduct. Our revision process includes a number of steps to ensure thorough and thoughtful deliberation of the recommended, recommended revisions. I will be referencing the draft student code of conduct included in the agenda item as the re revisions are presented. Accountability for our level of responses will change this year. Oh, I'm sorry. The new guidelines align purposely with a tiered system of supports as the foundation for our responses to behavior. As we review the changes, you will see a number of adjustments to the level responses. These align with the level responses in the guidelines and are based on those five categories we discussed earlier. To begin with the introductory pages, you will note that revisions have been made to um, the dates and the welcome letter and the table of contents. You're also going to note throughout the document that revisions were made to school board and superintendent to make them consistent in their representation. On page five, the paragraph referenced earlier when we discussed policy JGE regarding parent responsibilities can be found there. In order to build our common vocabulary in responding to student behavior, the consequences level, which is what we've call, called it in previous versions of the Code of Conduct, have been renamed to leveled responses to student behavior. The interventions have also been revised and added to. You'll see that um, we have changed the behavior essay to a behavior reflection form. That's really what the students know it as. Is it, it, it asks them what happened, and it asks them why, so we can understand the function, function of the behavior. And then it, it gives them an opportunity to say how they might do, do it differently next time. So it's really just a chance to think about what happened, and then teachers will dialogue with them about those reflection forms. Um, we've moved alternative classroom setting from level two to level one. We've added parent and or teacher to student conferences. We think it's a partnership and that that should be acknowledged. And we've added tier two interventions as a level two option. Um, throughout the rules section, you will see that revisions to the level responses for a number of rules. That's where we do the ranges like one to five, one to four. These revisions are were made to align with the state guidelines. And again, our, our 
committee walked through each one of those and discussed them in detail. Um, they met a number of times to make sure that they were really considering every, every angle of, of what needed to be adjusted. Uh, <coughs> during the earlier presentation of revisions to policy JFC student conduct, the substantive changes to rules were reviewed in detail. The following is a summary of those changes as they are reflected in the student code of conduct. Uh, I apologize, the page numbers did not transfer in our draft document and that will be corrected before it's finalized. Um, but just to review those changes to the rules, one new rule was added to align with the state stalking category. That is the only new rule. We did have six rules that we are deleting. We also have seven rules that have been renamed to align with the category wording in the revised guidelines. Repeat all those. Following the rules section in the student code of conduct are a number of supporting relevant policies. And, and just to review, there are four of those that we've talked about recently. Two policies included in the 2019-2020 student code of conduct have been brought before you tonight with a recommendation to be retired. The staff, the draft student code of conduct indicates that they will be deleted if the policies are approved in that manner. And that was JGD and JGE. And finally, we have two policies that have either been reviewed or updated. The first one is policy JFCF, which was reviewed and approved at the March 24th, 2020 board meeting. There were no changes to that policy, but it has been reviewed. And then policy JFCJ, which is before you tonight um, with a recommendation to revise, recode, and rename it to weapons in school. This concludes the recommended revisions to the student code of conduct. I'm happy to answer any questions. That was very thorough. Thank you for all that work. Ms. Hummel. Yes, that's a lot of work. Um, I just had a couple questions. It looks like in the Code of Conduct, when there is a phone icon, mm -hmm. that means it's mandatory reporting. Is that correct? That is mandatory reporting. Um, is that little icon meaning anywhere? Am I just missing it? Well, it should be at the bottom of every page. So it, it went, it went, no, it went somewhere with the page numbers. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I know <laughs> it's usually there at the bottom of every page. Okay. Um, so nope. yeah, if that could get added back. Yeah. I have a feeling it, it's a different program that this is, that's laid out to use this. So uh, we'll, we'll make sure that gets back in there. Thank you. No, the wording does say that it requires notification, okay. police notification. And then I know there's been a lot in the press about, um, the school to prison pipeline, all those kind of concerns that, that all of us have. Um, but I just want to make clear to anyone who's looking at this code of conduct that this is a, a Virginia code that we have to comply with. It's not a choice for us. It is mandatory reporting based on code of Virginia. So I, that is correct. And, and the important that. word there is notification. We are notifying them of the offense. It doesn't mean charges. It could lead to charges, but it means that we are required to notify them. Uh, in most cases, we're notifying one of our SROs in all of our middle schools and high schools. That is the notification, um, is to notify them. Um, students can be counseled. They can be referred to diversion programs. Um, there are a number of different steps that can happen um, in, in lieu of actual formal charges. And that's really up to the police department. That's our, our obligation is to notify them. And then how that's handled is, is, is within their practices and procedures. If I could just build on that and then I'll ask my colleagues um, for additional comments and questions. But leading to that, um, there's been conversation about the need for SROs in our schools. And so that's a very good example of a great partnership because our SROs know our students. And so we oftentimes do notify them of an incident, but because they know the student and they mentor the student, um, sometimes that's, that's what takes place and it doesn't go any further than that. Is that accurate? Yes, that is accurate. And, and we would say they're absolutely essential. They, they create relationships with students and they're able to help us know things that, that are important to be able to support students separate from any sort of legal 
activity that might be going on. Um, you know, they, they work very closely with us. So in a way, having the SROs is venting maybe what would normally be an escalation to having to report to law enforcement outside with someone who doesn't know our students, who doesn't have a relationship. Correct. And then having whatever happens there with an impersonal kind of relationship versus a we we absolutely see it as a preventative and proactive approach. Thanks. Dr. Dowell? Uh, I appreciate this line of discussion and, and speaking as a former police officer, that's the reason you become a police officer. You want to make those, those uh, meaningful differences at the state. Here's some water. Can they not? You okay? You don't want it? Anyway, so I, I, I appreciate this line of questioning and yeah, they are absolutely essential and I think many of our students agree with that too. So thank you. All thank three you. of our high school SROs were at all three graduations this week. Oh, I know. I know the, the connection is great. Thank you, Mr. Dow. Ms. Young. And the only the only thing I just want to add to that is I mean often I think SROs also provide advocacy for our students, which often is necessary because as you said, they do know the students. But secondly, thank you so much for this tremendous amount of work. I mean I look at that and I go that's a lot of work. So uh, I do appreciate it. But I did have a question. So I noticed that um, these meetings started in February, but you get you get this type of guideline every year from the state of Virginia. Thankfully, no. This is a major revision that they did, and they did it um, in order to really try to align with, with the concept of the tiered interventions and, and addressing behavior and social-emotional needs through a more tiered um, proactive preventative approach and and that was the whole impetus behind their revision uh, and so it's it's a very extensive guideline um, it took a lot of time to review we um, trainings for it didn't start until December of 2019 so we attended some trainings to be able to better understand the framework that they had created um, in order to more uh, effectively make our revisions. So it's it's been a process, and I hope it doesn't get I'm revised sign, anytime sign. soon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Bourgeois. And then just wanted to add, to for the public to understand, um, at, harking back to what Mr. Dow said, so police officers who choose to be SROs have additional training, and they that's they a do. choice. They choose to be in our schools. They want to be in our schools. We're lucky that we have alumni in our schools. Correct. But it's it's a it's a choice. It's an, it's an additional training. There is additional training that they go to when they become an SRO, and then there are annual um, conferences that are a school police safety conference that helps continue to build that relationship. Thank you. Um, Ms. Cook, do you have comments or questions? Yeah, actually, I have two comments and three quick questions. Um, uh, first, I wanted to echo everyone's thanks. Uh, aligning multiple policies into a single document is really uh, a Herculean task, and I appreciate uh, you and the team doing that, Ms. Bourgeois. And I uh, also appreciated very much your sharing with us who was on the committee and your um, kind of your logic behind that. Um, and, and, and I think that's great. I just normally, in years past, you've had a couple of community representatives on the committee, and so I'm hoping that in future years, when the when the it's not so much of an overhaul, um, you might circle back to that practice because I think it's a it's a good one. Um, and, and then my, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, our original intent was to expand the committee, um, and then with the school closure and the reality of all the adjustments we were making, um, we just weren't able to make that happen. So that's absolutely our intent moving forward. Thank you. And then, um, so the leveled response, does that align with the MTSS work, or does that just happen to be a similar kind of thinking? It, um, it, does, it does align somewhat um, as far as, I mean, level one especially, it would be your, your tier one responses, which really means that's the, a part of the t training piece with teachers. A lot of those things are things that teachers can do with students in classrooms. It, it doesn't even need to come out of the classroom. Um, especially for those more minor offenses. Um, so that is part of, of the, the framework that was used to develop the guidelines. Thank you. And my second question has to do with um, the discussion around SROs and how they're really part of the school community and build relationships. 
Um, if you could just take a few minutes, um, I assume the handle, your handle with CARE initiative is somehow connected to this. Could you just speak to that for just a moment so people are aware of that? Sure, thanks for asking. Um, so we started this year a Handle with Care initiative. It is um, mirrored off of something that we read about from West Virginia, quite honestly, and I reached out to Sergeant Campbell, and, and he thought it was a great idea, so he, he worked it up his chain of approval. Um, and it, it's really very simple. If, if there's something that happens in the community that, is, that exposes our students to potential trauma, whether it's in their home or in the neighborhood, um, I get an email that says handle with care and it has a child's name on it. I don't know the details, I'll never know the details, um, but it lets me notify the school to handle that child with care. And again, we, we don't ask, we don't tell, we just know that if that child comes in and they don't have their homework the next day, it's okay. You know, we don't even need to ask a question. We just need to adjust and, and, and give them some time to do that. If they look tired or sleepy, they, we, we, we support them in being able to make sure that their needs are being taken care of. Um, and uh, the principals have been very appreciative of that. And, um, you know, we, we, we hope it's making an impact. It's one of those data points that we won't ever have a specific outcome to be able to measure it with. Um, but it just feels like a nice thing to be doing to take care of your kids. And I presume a child who comes in uh, to school with a handle with care message might have a, the, the school leadership might have a different response uh, in the code of conduct in response to that handle with care. Absolutely. Yeah. And then my last question actually is for you, Ms. Ombi. Just um, if you could just briefly, I know you've been to a couple of presentations about the prison to pipeline, since Ms. Hummel brought it up, just how that initial um, report that got all the headlines may not have quite been uh, as accurate as, as, uh, as it, we may have originally thought. So I don't know if you wanted to share with the public that for those people who are concerned about our discipline uh, mm -hmm. and how that impacts students and their futures. Um, I, you can chime in as well as Ms. Hummel. I think the bottom line is some the the statistics were misleading, and so for our region, it, it looked as though those numbers, the prison to pipeline numbers, particularly the, um, I guess at all levels, K-12, were um, inflated just based on reporting. Yeah, I think it had something to do with the state of Virginia. It was and definitions. A, it was a national, so we went to a school board meeting, <coughs> uh, a, a national school board association meeting, where there was a, um, a, a researcher from Virginia Tech who, because I think this was maybe three years ago, four years ago, Virginia was in the news for having this horrible uh, school to prison pipeline problem that was, the stats were just really bad. And so this researcher from um, Virginia Tech looked into it and it, it was a uh, it was a reporting it, it it was a reporting issue uh, the data was misleading in that yeah in definitions of the way that um, Virginia was uh, reporting in one way and other states were reporting in another way so anyway but I, I think um, at that point, there was all this really, this publicity that was out there that wasn't necessarily a true reflection of what was going on in the state of Virginia. I don't think we're saying that they're, that the state of Virginia is perfect in any any way, shape, or form, but it, it wasn't as, as quite as, as bad as it was initially. <clears throat> I think we'd have to go back. Um, we would have to, do you know something? Are you, did you want to play Jim, Jim Kelly? Or Jim Bates? I'm sorry? Did anyone else remember that? I mean, it was it was probably three or four years ago. I do remember that presentation. And um, <clears throat> um, as I recall, it was, the numbers were dramatically disturbing for what they, what they said the prison, the pipeline in uh, Virginia was. And uh, I'm, I remember that uh, that researcher looking into it and kind of it was it was a reporting problem. I do remember that. 
Ms. Cook, did you want to add on to that? No, no, no. I, I just wanted to make it clear that um, in case anyone was concerned about it, since Ms. Hummel brought it up, that um, that what was reported in the media wasn't particularly accurate. And of course, when that happens, the media doesn't follow up with the corrections usually. So, Dr. Beers, did you have comments? Uh, no, I do not. <coughs> Okay, we will be voting on these proposed items um, shortly here this evening. So unless there are additional comments, we will move on to the consent agenda. Um, item 7. Hey, Lisa, Lisa, oh, Lisa. Oh, Mr. Kelly, Lisa. yes, Mr. Kelly. Uh, no, no worries. Um, as I said earlier, that you know, this is a very challenging putting this whole code of conduct together. And I appreciate the cross-section of the committee, uh, the school system that, that worked on that and uh, and uh, Steph, Ms. Bourgeois, I know we met, said they met several times. I'm sure they're maintaining all their social distancing and doing all those correct things. Um, and I also appreciate the comments about the SROs, and, and uh, they are a true partnership with our school community. And uh, that, it's not that way in other localities, and that's unfortunate. Um, but the, the way we handle them here, it is uh, very much a partnership. And uh, we, I know we've had to make some adjustments when it, when it kind of – in a different way. And I also want to thank Ms. Bourgeois for the uh, talking about the handle with care information. I, I appreciate uh, putting that out in the public domain. So thanks for that. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. And, and that made me think of another question, Ms. Bourgeois. So because our relationship with our SROs is different than in many other communities, do we make an effort to explain that to family, particularly new families or transfer families? Um, because especially now because there's been so much in the media about that's a bad thing. Um, and that may cause us to stop and look at that. That's certainly something I can talk with the SROs and the sergeant about how we might want to address that. And I know years ago when my oldest, and he's 23 now, was at Tawana Middle School, the SRO did a lot of um, like after school, like mentoring and activities, and and he would talk to the PTA on a regular basis. So we we understood what his function was and appreciated that. And so, but I don't, I, I haven't had that experience since that kid of mine was in middle school. So the supervision of the SROs is actually transitioning July one. So that certainly is an opportunity for me to talk with the new supervisor about how we might want to incorporate that suggestion. That would be great. Comments? Okay. All right. I think now we're going to move on to the consent agenda. Item 7.1, um, approval of minutes from meeting uh, May 19th, 2020, and 7.2, personnel action items. Um, Mr. Kelly, would you move that we approve the consent agenda as presented? Madam Chair, I move we approve uh, approval of the consent agenda as presented. Thank you. And Ms. Young, would you second that, please? A second, please. Okay. Uh, any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Serza. Ms. Cook. Aye. Mr. Dowell. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Ongby. Aye. Okay, moving on to action items. <clears throat> Um, item 8.1, financial report and monthly bills and payroll for 2020. Mr. Dow, would you move? Yeah. You Madam that? Chair, I do move that the board approve the financial report and monthly bills and payroll for the month ended May 31st, 2020. Thank you. And that's Young? Second. Any discussion? Madam Chair, I have a question. Yes, Ms. Cook. I have a, um, uh, Ms. Ewing, um, I just could you speak? I asked this, I think, last month, but I'm I'm still con uh, continuing to look at the Child Nutrition Services Fund concern. Um, do you have any thoughts on that, or um, specifically, in your experience, do local do school divisions ever have to use local funds to um, bolster CNS funds, and how does that work? And um, are you concerned about that? Yes, school divisions currently this year, I'm aware of, are having to use local funds to support their child nutrition services funds because they don't have the built-up fund balance that we have here in Williamsburg. Do you, do you anticipate that that might be ha something that we have to consider for next fiscal year? That is a possibility um, for next fiscal year, yes, ma'am. <coughs> 
Thank you. And then the other um, question I have is just in terms of the uh, local appropriation from Williamsburg and James City County from their general funds, they both fully funded the school division in this current fiscal year. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And so the only deficiency we're experiencing is through the path through state sales tax for education. Is that correct? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? So the, the reduction that we're experiencing is, is from their pass through of the state sales tax for education. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. They will pass on anything that they have received. When these reports were prepared, I did not have any additional information to share. I did get the June sales tax information this week, which amounts to about $1.1 million, and that represents um, sales activity from the month of April. So those funds will be transferred over to us this month as well. But you had predicted zero, right, going forward? I had, yes, ma'am. Okay. So that's better news than we had feared. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, Ms. Ewing, just to make that clear, so right now we're looking at about $2.5 million budget deficit primarily from the state, but you're saying that the one we're looking at receiving $1.4 million? When you compare our the projected revenue to the projected expenditures, I was have been projecting a surplus of two point one million. So with this additional sales tax funding for the month of June, that bumps up to about three million. There is a possibility that it, some state revenue won't come in, but I don't have any additional information at this time. Thank you. And are there additional? So, so um, yeah, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, Ms. Ms. Ewing. So. So the money that we get in April, April sales tax revenue comes to us in June. So the May and June sales tax revenue flips over to, to uh, next fiscal year during these unprecedented times that we're in. Well, actually, we'll be accruing that back to the current fiscal year. That's the normal procedures each year. So the funds received in July and August are accrued back to the prior fiscal year. Oh, so so we could actually be seen be, be even better by the time we get to the uh, end of the day. That is that is correct. Yes, sir. Great. Thank you. Dr. Beers, did you have comments or questions for Ms. Ewing? No, I I think um, it's been as thoroughly presented as as possibly could, and uh, I, as once again, I always appreciate how much effort and work goes into. Uh, creating these documents that continually have to change. So um, uh, I very much appreciate that. Thank you, Dr. Beers. Okay, moving on to item, item uh, 8.2, adoption of the amended fiscal year 21 operating budget. Before I ask for a motion, I wanted to just give some background, primarily. Roll. Oh. Hello, I went someplace else. Ms. Serza, would you call the roll, please? Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Mr. Dowell? Aye. Ms. Elby? Aye. Okay. All right, now moving on to item 8.2. I um, wanted to give some background information primarily for the public. Um, so in terms of the budget approval process, we began our budget planning last January. Um, staff worked diligently to create a budget of need that was data-driven and tied directly to the division's strategic plan. The school board is required by the Code of Virginia to approve a budget of need following the timeline approved by the board. Um, we approved and transmitted the 2021 budget to our funding partners on March 17th with a deadline for transmittal of April 1. We recognized and stated at that time that we knew that budget would be impacted by COVID-19. We had only just closed WHC schools for two weeks on March 13th because of the pandemic. We stated publicly that the budget we approved on March 17th was the best thinking at the time. We recognized then that many of the new items in that budget, teacher raises, additional guidance counselors, special ed teachers and aides, English language learner, teachers and aides, behavioral interventionists, as well as updated technology that would have made transportation and other departments more efficient, would most likely not survive budget reductions, and they did not. Um, by April, it was clear that the localities and our funding partners would be experiencing revenue declines because of COVID. In addition, we would be experiencing state losses, uh, revenue losses as well. 
The Board of Supervisors recommended for consideration 5, 10, 15, and 20% budget cuts to their county budget as well as the school divisions. The City Council um, had access to reserves and they plan to tap into that <coughs> to make the school's budget whole. In response to the Board of Supervisors budget reduction considerations, WJCC leadership produced for the school board and the public budget reduction scenarios of 5, 10, and 15%. Both the city, the county, and the public weighed in on those scenarios and worked to mitigate the sting of those budget cuts to the school division due to a decline in revenue. Both the city and the county approved their respective budgets in the last week and a half, and so that brings us to today, where the superintendent has presented to our board an amended 2021 budget for approval. We would typically have approved our budget by around May 15th, um, I would like to have a motion and a second on the floor so that we may discuss and allow Dr. Heron and Ms. Nguyen to update us on the amendments before voting on them. Ms. Madam Chair? Yes. Madam Chair? Yes. As a member of the School Board of Williamsburg James City County, I acknowledge that I have an interest in the fiscal year 2020-2021 school budget because my wife is an employee of the WJCC schools. However, I believe that I am able to participate in the consideration of and vote on the budget fairly in the public interest. Thank you. And Ms. Cook? Thank you, Madam Chair. As a member of the School Board of Williams and <clears throat> James County, I acknowledge that I have an interest in the fiscal year 2021 school budget because I'm an employee of the Williamsburg Health Foundation. However, I believe I'm able to participate in the consideration of and vote on the budget fairly and in the public's interest. Thank you, Ms. Cook. And is there a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I move that we adopt uh, the adoption of the amended fiscal year 21 operating budget in the amount of $155,642,800. Is Thank you, Ms. Hummel. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Young. And now we can discuss, but maybe before we discuss, I will pass it to Dr. Heron and Ms. Ewing to give us an update and then we can discuss it. Yep. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the opportunity to present the superintendent's proposed amended budget uh, for this year. Next year, we will be doing more with less, less resources, less people, possibly less face-to-face -face time in the classroom, all at a time when there's been a loss of learning for our most vulnerable students. COVID-19 has highlighted our inequities, and we must do everything to ensure the safety and success of our students. Even with less resources, with focus and intentionality, we will make sure every student is valued, safe, and successful. Ms. Ewan will provide a brief presentation on the amended budget this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Heron. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the board. For your consideration this evening, I will be presenting the superintendent's proposed amendments to the fiscal year 21 operating budget. We are grateful to our funding partners for approving the reappropriation of $2 million in unspent funds back to next year's operating budget, which was saved by WJCC schools during this school year. These savings were the result of our stringent budget management and numerous cost-saving measures since March 2020. This will allow the school division to protect instructional resources and programs for students and reduce the likelihood of staff layoffs. With these additional funds allocated, this restores the contributions from the localities to their original proposed funding level for fiscal year 21. Without these funds, we would essentially be level funded by the localities for the next school year. There is still uncertainty surrounding the impact to the state and local economy, so the proposed amended budget does assume a reduction in education sales tax and state lottery funding of 40%. The localities will pass through all education sales tax revenue that is received during the year, and we will continue to monitor these revenue streams. Factoring in these adjustments, we are looking at a reduction to our current year budget of 830000 Here you will see mandatory and essential expenditure increases that we know we will have next year, which amounts to approximately $1.7 these increases include the mandatory VRS rate increase, contractual obligation increases, insurance increases, the estimated cost for trailers, an increase to instructional technology funds to support digital learning, and four FTEs to support special education services. Those positions include one special education teacher, one special education aide, and two interpreters. These positions are to support our current needs. When you factor these expenditure increases with the revenue reduction, we will need to reduce our expenditures by at least $2.5 million from our current year budget. I want to stress that the recommended cuts that I'm about to share are based on our current budget 
not the school board's previously approved budget for next school year. That budget included necessary increases, which were eliminated right off the top. The recommended cuts you're about to see are on top of that. As you know, Dr. Heron shared a list of potential reduction strategies. We are happy to say that we will not need to eliminate middle school sports or fine arts programs in the division as previously considered. There are, however, several other cuts that will significantly impact student learning and the resources and compensation we are able to provide for staff. As you see on this slide, recommended adjustments include a reduction in central office staff totaling 120,000. We are also reducing funding for conference travel and professional development. Based on an analysis of the current secondary schedule, which began before the pandemic, there is a recommendation to adjust the middle school teaching load and make efficiency adjustments to high school staffing as well. A recommended reduction in the number of teacher aides at elementary school will cut 210,000 and the suspension of in-person field trips will save $90,000. In addition, we are cutting 600,000 by reducing department and school budgets. There is a recommendation to suspend the tuition assistance program for employees. We plan to reduce the number of bus drivers by not filling open positions and suspend the purchase of new buses. We cut 80,000 by discontinuing the IB program at James River and transitioning a grounds worker position to the county. And the largest savings, 675,000 comes from attrition. After factoring in the mandatory expenditure increases and the recommended expenditure reductions outlined this evening, our expenditure budget totals $139,737,358, leaving a total of approximately $951,000 unallocated. This is by design. It is our recommendation that this be held in a contingency account since there is still a lot of uncertainty on what next school year will look like, as well as uncertainty about state sales tax and lottery funded revenues. To be clear, this is not extra funding. It is purposely held to respond to what our greatest needs are in the fall and to respond to the changing landscape of teaching and learning. With these amendments, the operating budget will total $140,688,700, or a decrease of $830,658, or 0.6% under the current year. The other significant change from the proposed budget is within the Grants Fund, which has changed to incorporate our anticipated CARES Act funding, as well as the CARES Act funding allocated to us from both the county and city. Total CARES Act funding amounts to just over $3.2 million. This is intended for one-time expenditures and will not be a continued source of funding going forward. With the addition of the CARES Act funding, the grants fund now totals $9.1 million. For a grand total of all funds in the amount of $155,642,800 that we are seeking approval for tonight. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Ms. Ewing. I'll just start round robin because I'm sure everyone has comments and questions. Ms. Young? Okay, we'll start with round. Mr. Dow? Uh, thank you for putting this together and helping us understand it better. Uh, the reduction of department school budget, 600000 Can you help me understand what exactly that is and looks like? Um, the schools, we are reducing their per pupil allocations by 10%. So um, currently, elementary um, and middle school per pupil amounts allocated are 135 per student, and high school is 200. So those will be reduced to 122 for elementary and middle school, and high school will be reduced to 190. Um, department budgets. Um, elimination of Hanover Research. There won't be any program reviews in fiscal year 21. Um, the career investigation software program for middle school and high schools that was budgeted um, won't be included. These are a couple of examples. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Kelly. <clears throat> I wasn't expecting that one. <laughs> um, couple of questions. The um, money for uh, the IB program, A, I thought that was already baked in, and B, I thought it was more than that. 
It's, this is a comparison to our current fiscal 20 budget. Yes, it was built into the proposed budget that we reviewed in March. So it's just, again, a comparison from the current year budget to the next year budget. So yes, it was already incorporated, but it was just 28,000 that included the membership fees and um, required professional development and possibly some materials. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. The other, um, the other thing, so, you know, we're passing this budget here, but we still have so many unknowns for next school year that they could go really kind of either way as far as our revenues go. Um, I heard today from the state that uh, they were expecting a billion dollar revenue re reduction and now they're thinking it's going to be uh, less than that. And so how that all comes down and gets flaked out is, is just going to be, um, it'd be interesting to see. There's so many, uh, so many, so many more risks in these challenging times that we've got that it's just going to, um, it's kind of hard to really pass a budget. The one thing which I would have, I would have liked to see here, um, I know we have the contingency at 950 is the is the increase for the substitutes. I think that was like 50,000, um, and I just think that uh, you know substitute teachers next year, assuming that we are in school, is going to be uh, hard and hard to do. That I would I would like to have seen the, the the minor number for the substitutes increase in here, but but uh, I understand. So that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Ms. Cook? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Heron and you, Ms. Ewing, for your hard work on this. Uh, you, you probably built this budget at least three times, um, so um, thank you for that. Um, and I'd like to thank the city and the county and their teams uh, for their uh, cooperative work. I, I will say that um, when I watched the meetings from the city and the county, um, both uh, Mr. Stevens and Mr. Trivet were incredibly complimentary to Dr. Heron and to you uh, for, uh, for your cooperation and your, um, your expertise. So, um, so I just wanted to thank you for that and thank them and, and the Board of Supervisors and the City Council. So I just have some, uh, several questions. Um, the first, if, if I understood you correctly, from their general fund, both localities held us leveled this year for fiscal year 21 from fiscal year 20. Is that correct? When you factor in the additional $2 million that they've allocated, they, yes, they level funded us based on what they had originally proposed. Okay, now, now I'm even more confused. So level funded us from their current fiscal year, the fiscal year or from, from our original request? When you compare to our current fiscal year, we are getting um, two million, approximately $2 million more than what we currently received in fiscal 20. Okay, so both localities increased their funding to the school division this year from their general fund. Yes, based on the reallocation of the $2 million in our savings from the current fiscal year. Correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, and, then, um, and then, again, this has been a very, very dynamic situation. At first, we were looking at you know, a fairly large gap, um, and um, the community really um, spoke uh, in, in hopes of narrowing that gap, and, and the last time we got information from you and shared it with the public. We were looking at a $2.5 million gap, but then now it's, um, because of increased expenses, it's more like 830,000 um, 830, uh, for, for fiscal year 21's uh, operating budget, right? Yes. Okay, so, it, so that because of that $2 million and because of what the localities gave us, we've narrowed it even further. Yes. Um, and then the CARES Act funding, although that's only one time funding, carries us over to $2.5 million more over our current fiscal year budget, right? No. Yes, look, looking at all of the funds, including the grants fund, oh. yes. Okay. But uh, nonetheless, uh, we still are going to be down 25 <clears throat> FTEs. Is that correct? That is correct. 
can you please, just for the sake of the public, let us know what those 25 are approximately? And, and also, they're from attrition, not from, we're not, not from a reduction of force. Correct. They, they are all from attrition, from um, resignations and retirements for this current fiscal year. Um, there are seven open teaching assistant positions at the elementary level. Um, due to the changes with the middle school <clears throat> scheduling, there are eight middle school teachers. There are two clerical staff at central office. And on average, over the year, we have around 15 vacancies with bus drivers, and we're reducing the bus drivers by 10. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then the contingency fund, you know, that's, that's a lot of money. Um, <laughs> Can you, and, and, and I know in a time of uncertainty, it's really good to have that. Um, and I think basically you created a on-the-fly contingency fund um, with your fiscal uh, restraint in the last you know, quarter of this fiscal year. But can you give us a sense of what that contingency fund could be used for? I just don't have a sense of what. Um, surely you've thought about that. Can you just give us a sense of a couple of ideas? Yeah, Ms. Cook, we, we haven't talked about it in detail, but obviously all of the recommended uh, adjustments to the budget are things that are valuable from professional development to teaching aids at elementary uh, to even bus drivers if we do need them in reality once we start up and running again. Uh, we would hope to bring back some of our losses with that money, but we're holding it in reserve at this moment in time. So we will look at the landscape and really assess our needs and uh, see where best to use uh, that uh, funding once we, d we know we don't need it because of COVID-19. Okay, so you, you might use it for, to hire people as opposed to one-time Absol Absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and then um, I'd like to just talk a little bit about what you didn't cut. Um, this year, um, some of the things that were on uh, an original list when we didn't know how deeply we would be cut, um, but that survived. And depending on how this works out, um, you know, that may or may not be on the table for next year. So we heard today uh, from some parents talking about uh, world languages. Could you talk about that? And, um, you know, I, I don't think that, that was really ever on the uh, chopping block, but um, if you could talk about that. Um, I'd appreciate that and to understand what that means. Um, the one thing I'm aware of with the world languages is a, a class uh, was not running at middle school because it only had seven students uh, sign up for the class. Uh, we are looking at different options to pro still provide the program, but we're, we're actually looking at staffing right now. As you know, with um, being fiscally responsible, we're really looking at the size of classes above middle and high school. Uh, through in every single course to manage our resources much more efficiently. And that was one of those issues that, that was mentioned by several parents tonight. Okay, so that's not a cut, that's just a class selection issue. Which that's a class, that's a student-driven class selection issue. That's correct. Okay. Um, so some of the things that, um, you know, so arts were preserved, arts programming, athletic programming, um, other programming such as AP, um, increasing class size, class offerings in general. Um, another thing that was preserved uh, and not put on the table by you was longevity pay. And as I was looking at Ms. Ewing's presentation, particularly around sa uh, savings from attrition, can you talk about longevity pay and its impact on attrition as time goes on? I presume the amount of money we can save on attrition is going to go down as people with longevity pay stipends start to ex or continue to exit the division. Can you can you talk about that for a second? Yes, at the moment, the longevity pay costs uh, the division for uh, roughly about 90 people about $600,000. It's something that was provided many, many years ago to staff with over 25 and 30 years experience. As each uh, member, senior member of staff and very valued members of staff exits the organization, then we do reap some of that money back again. So the amount of longevity pay goes down significantly every year. And I believe there's about 17 people exiting this year with longevity pay. 20. 20, 20 actually, up to 29. Up to 20. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a 
Okay, but but is my assumption right that as more and more people leave, the, our, the savings from attrition will over time go down because that stipend will no longer be part of that equation? Yes. That, yes, that is correct. Okay. okay. Yeah, and so, and then I just wanted to bring that up as an opportunity. I mean, that is a promise that we've made to our um, longest tenured um, teachers. Um, but if things continue to uh, get, can, if things don't improve, if we're not, if the economy doesn't bounce back and uh, our localities continue to struggle financially, that is something that unfortunately we may um, have to uh, look at. Um, and then, Madam Chair, my last uh, questions have to do with equity, um, and, and I'm concerned about equity m now more than ever, and I appreciate your opening remarks on that, Dr. Heron, very much. And I um, really appreciated your original budget, which addressed equity, I think, really well by um, proposing hiring uh, 30 additional, 30, more than 30 additional staff members dedicated to the social, emotional, and administrative needs of students. And unfortunately, the pandemic really shattered that um, and, and took our really budget of need to, to below a budget of need, which is really where we are now. Um, but I, I believe we have to address um, equity even more so with this reduced budget, um, not only because it's a strategic priority, um, but more importantly, because we know our neediest kids are going to come back to us next year with even more needs. Uh, and that's widely discussed and written about nationally and in the state. And we have achievement gaps already, and we don't want to see them widen. widen and, and I, but I do think that we all suspect that they will widen, um, uh, given the current situation. Next, and next year, I think we have to be intentional um, with proportionate allocation of resources based on student population. Um, and so I really do think we need to do something with this budget to address that. And so I tried to understand how this budget was allocated uh, based on student population, and I asked about um, per pupil um, um, spending by school uh, based on population and per pupil staffing by school based on school population. And um, something that Ms. Ewing said earlier in the budget about reduction in per pupil uh, allocations to schools uh, at each level, you reduce that by 10%. Was that across the board or were some schools based on population reduced more or, or less? Or was it all the same no matter what the population of the school is? So the proposal is to reduce the per pupil by 10% for all the schools. And in reality, that would be a savings of approximately 130,000. We're just proposing to reduce by 100 and keeping that 30,000 in an equity line to address equity issues. So that 30,000 might go to schools depending on student need differently. Correct. OK, thank you. And then. Um, and then there's Title I money that we talked about a little bit more earlier in the meeting um, that, may, that does impact the elementary school level. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, and, and, and so, and then the, the figures that you sent, were, were special ed dollars um, included in that? Um, special ed teachers, or is that a separate part of the budget like the Title I? No. Beginning with the fiscal 20 budget, the special ed staffing is reflected in the school budget, so that is reflected in the information that I had provided. Thank you. And the same is the same thing true for the English language learner support or all, um, um, not ESL teachers because I know they're school-based, but like any other English language support, is that included in there? No, I have not allocated that out to the schools for the fiscal 20 budget. That still remained in the CNI cost center. So that is not reflected in these numbers, but I could um, get that information for you. Obviously, this, obviously, the English as a second language teachers are allocated based on the enrollment of English learners at any given school. So there is, there is an allocation of funds based on the needs of students. Also, the allocation of special education staff depends on the number and the needs of the students in any particular school. So there is a, a way of addressing equity through both of those things. Uh, when we talk about class size, we do have a plan and we do have um, an analysis of our different schools that we would love to implement. It's uh, impossible this year because of funding and also because of school space. Yes, 
Um, I, I would at some point love when you're ready to reveal that to the public. I'd love to see that. Um, but what I was looking for when I asked those questions was a pattern of resource allocation based on student need uh, by by uh, by risk uh, population. And um, and so I guess my question to you is there compared to the current budget we're in now and your proposed budget for next year, did you shift any resources um, at the school level to address equity? Um, I, you know, I'm, I, I just, I was trying to find that and, and, I, and I, I couldn't and I didn't get a chance to study it as long as I'd hoped, uh, but um, if you could just speak about how you're allocating resources based on populate, student need uh, by whether it's English language learners or special ed or uh, uh, economically disadvantaged, I'd really like to um, understand that because I'll, I'll be honest with you, I'm really struggling with that. I just feel a need to really address that at the next budget and, um, I, and I'm looking for it and I'm not finding it. it um, and I would, I would hope you could talk me through that. I think the main allocation of funds when you look at teacher to student ratio especially at the elementary level, like Stonehouse and Matoka have a 23 to 1 ratio of student to teacher. And then we have six other schools that are Title I schools um, in the 30 to 40 percent range, and their student to teacher ratio is from 20 to 22. And then we have James River at 70 percent free and reduced lunch, and I believe its ratio is about 19 to 1. So there is a, there is a we do allocate resources in terms of staffing based to a to some extent on free and reduced lunch, lunch and the needs of schools. Even when we uh, had to we remove teacher assistant positions through attrition, we reallocated uh, teacher assistants by school and by need, and James River again was kept at a different level to the other schools. Um, I mean, equity is about special education as well. And as you're aware, we, we allocate teachers and resources based on the needs of the students at every single school. And it's done on a very specific points basis that drives that funding. Uh, as Ms. Ewing said already, we take English as a second language teachers and we allocate those based on enrollment of English learners and their level of need uh, in, in language acquisition. And that is again a, a structural equity thing that we that's how we allocate resources. Um, we also take our CNI teaching and learning resources, all of our support staff, and we allocate their time based on the needs of the school as well. Um, we did mention several times tonight that seven of our nine elementary schools have Title I funding as well, which is very much based on, on students uh, who um, are in need as well. We do have one um, bonus, I guess, this year, which in a, an incredibly difficult budget time, we do have CARES Act funding that is allocated to WJCC schools. And we've earmarked that for addressing inequities and coping with equity gaps and addressing the COVID-19 slide, as it's been named. Uh, we're going to set some of that aside for remediation, tutoring, curriculum, customization to beat the COVID-19 slide an adaptive reading program, and many other resources that I feel will be one time, yes, but will help us address our immediate need in, uh, due to the lack of other funding. And those are just some of the things that I feel we're already doing and, and doing very well. Thank you. <coughs> Dr. Beers, did you have comments or questions for Ms. Ewing? Uh, no, I, I made enough comments and, and my questions have been answered. <clears throat> Over the last uh, couple of months, um, I um, do, I would like to say once again uh, to the Board of Supervisors that this, we are in and we will continue to be in a crisis in this community as it, as it affects our educational system. Um, and I think uh, it would be uh, really appropriate if they could loosen up uh, some of the dollars that they're saving for, I guess, a crisis sometime in the future, like a hurricane. Uh, and, and I'm looking at a major tornado going on right now. So um, uh, I think our staff and the superintendent have gone as far as they possibly can go 
without uh, resulting in uh, seriously putting our students at a disadvantage. Um, and I know I'm going to, you know, they're going to fuss at me, but I don't care. I, I, I'm, I'm a member of this board. We have our responsibilities. Um, and uh, that's my thinking along those lines. Thank you, Dr. Beers. My colleagues here on the dais, do you have additional comments? Ms. Hummel? Hi, I just um, appreciated Dr. Heron's explanation about your actions that you're taking for the COVID slide. Um, and I, I think it would be worthwhile in a future school board meeting to actually have a presentation to, the, to us and so the community can see what, um, a couple things like how we're uh, working to address some of the um, achievement gaps and recognizing that there will be a COVID slide and then what actions the school's taking to address it. And uh, I, I think educating our community about the actions you're taking is going to be um, very helpful. Uh, I also would hope that uh, I agree with uh, Mrs. Cook that the 10% per pupil reduction across the board gave me pause when I heard it because there's, in, in my mind, there is definitely um, value in kind of recognizing that we do have populations of risk that we, that that just doing an across-the-board cut uh, per pupil <clears throat> sends a message that that's not being recognized when uh, um, I'm sure you're taking other actions, but I think it would be nice to either um, recognize that and say that to everyone and let us all know uh, so that we become more comfortable with accepting this budget, this amended budget. Thank you, Mrs. Hummel. As, as Ms. Ewan mentioned earlier, there is a, a portion of that, that that we are holding back to address equity issues and the per pupil spending on purpose for that very reason. Thank you. Mr. Dow? I don't have anything additional. Thank you. Ms. Young? Yes, I, I just wanted to, to point out I, um, that, that this budget, um, everything has been done to preserve jobs. Uh, for our current staff. Uh, those, uh, as Ms. Ewing mentioned, all of the attrition has been through retirements and resignations. And um, I, I was looking uh, frantically, but our budget last year, as was pointed out, was $141,519,358. This year, our budget, our proposed budget is 140. Six hundred eighty-eight, seven hundred dollars. That's the amended budget. Our original budget proposal was for one hundred and forty-eight million, one hundred and two thousand five hundred dollars. So we are. Uh, this budget is eight million dollars short of that. And um, and the thing I'm most grateful for about this budget, although this is very disheartening, is the fact that we are able to to maintain our staff and our our teachers and, and make sure that classrooms are covered. And when I realize that there's going to be some major changes in the fall, but I do want to recognize the fact that, that the school division is doing everything possible to preserve as much as possible. And, um, and I appreciate that because it's, it's a concern. We don't need to be adding to the unemployment numbers as well as everything else that's going on. So I, the only other thing I want to say is that we know that in the fall because of COVID, uh, things there's going to be additional cleaning. There's going to be a need for um, mask and everything else. And I know that we're going to have a presentation later that's going to be talking about what's happening coming up. And I'm looking forward to that. So thank you. I just have a couple questions and then some comments. Um, so just for some more clarification, because it is it is but just complicated. Um, the, the two additional dollars, two million dollars that were. Um, we allocated back to us um, wasn't wasn't new money from the board of supervisors. That was money that we had saved. Correct. Right. So that wasn't it wasn't it wasn't additional money. I just want to make that that clear. 
um, but that, that's money that we worked really hard to save. And then with regard to the contingency fund, Dr. Heron, that's just under a million dollars, you spoke earlier that you know, possibly if things begin to look better, we might use that for staff. Um, might we also be able to tap into those dollars if we see a specific remedial need um, or an equity issue at a, at a certain school? Absolutely. And then, um, disregard to the school board budget, I want to make it clear that the school board budget was cut as well, and so I'm assuming that was like folded into PD. Like we don't have a very big budget; it's that's, usually just that, travel to the national conference, which I'm guessing we will not go to. So, um, just want to make that that clear as, as well. And then, just have some comments. I'll probably want to echo again what so many of my colleagues said, but definitely want to thank staff for working tirelessly to update and amend this budget. That it was a lot of work, and, and so thank you for doing that. Thanks to the, to the community as well for your efforts and support of WJCC schools. Um, thanks also for taking the message of the importance of adequate funding for education to our state and federal funders as well. As elected and appointed school board members, it is the school board's responsibility to fiercely advocate for public education in WJCC. And we have the luxury, if you will, of narrowly focusing on just schools. I don't envy the Board of Supervisors or the City Council for that matter because their purview is so much larger. I think it's fair to say that each of us on this board are passionate about WJCC schools and we each do our level best to respect, uh, to support them. Um, we respect the fact that the county and the city must weigh competing interests. They have a very tough job and we appreciate their efforts to meet the financial needs of our school division. I've served on this board now almost four years and it, it's at this time of the year, each year, we explain that we have presented a budget of need, not a budget of wants to our funders. And at the end of the day, uh, the city and the county are able to fund us based <coughs> on the revenue that they have. Revenue continues to be an issue. Um, revenue, like any budget, is complex. The school receives federal, state, and local monies to support our students. The federal portion represents really less than 1%, the state 26%, and the localities um, over 70%. The Board of Supervisors and City Council fund the lion's share of our budget, and we're very, very grateful for that. But let me make it clear, it is in the best interest of our funding partners to do just that. And as one Board of Supervisor member has stated, we are all part of the same family the Board of Supervisors, the School Board, and the City Council as well. I agree that all three of our boards are connected and interdependent. We recognize that this year we're all facing a pandemic and budget deficits were not planned. But when we're no longer facing budget deficits due to this crisis, funding our schools adequately ensures that this division remains fully accredited, which is 13 years in a row now, that our graduation rates do not drop, and that we're able to continue to serve the ever-changing and increasingly more challenging student population, coupled with now extensive increased costs due to COVID-19. This year, we have been essentially level funded by our localities, and we're thankful for that. But level funding is equivalent to a budget cut because all other line items go up. Healthcare, Virginia retirement system contributions, liability insurance, special education needs, contractual obligations, et cetera. In the 2021 budget, there were approximately $1.7 million in increased mandatory cost. And as stated, we're currently down about $2.5 million in state funding, and there's, there's some movement there, and we're hopeful for that. But as stated tonight, we've lost 25 positions through attrition and secondary schedule changes, and that's not without a cost. Five elementary positions will go unfilled. Middle school teachers will now teach additional sections. They'll lose planning time. Additional teaching positions at the high school level will go unfilled, and teachers will be asked again to do more with less, with no raise, and an increase in their health care cost. And now in light of COVID, teachers will be faced with remediating many, many students and will be required to master both class-based and virtual lessons with the very real possibility that this division may be forced to bring all instruction totally online again in 2021 if there's a resurge of COVID. COVID-19 has impacted the 2021 budget hugely, and this is not a singular blip. The impact of COVID will go beyond this upcoming fiscal year. I ask the community and our funding partners to continue to support our schools, because at the end of the day, our schools are in many ways what make Williamsburg and James City County the community that it is. And lastly, we must continue to advocate at the state and federal level for adequate education funding. So with that, unless there are additional comments, um, Ms. Serza, we're going to call the room. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. 
Dr. Beers. Dr. Beers. Ms. Cook. Aye. Mr. Dowell. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Ms. Ombe. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Sorry. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item 8.3, adoption of amended five-year capital improvement plan for FY21 through 25 in the amount of uh, 67628000 Mr. Kelly? Make that motion. Sorry about that. Uh, Madam Chair, I move approval of the amended five-year capital improvement plan for fiscal year 21-25 in the amount of $67,628,000. Thank you. And Dr. Beers, would you like to second that? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Beers. Any discussion? I have a question, yes. Madam Chair. Yes. Um, don't we use, didn't we shift to a 10-year plan? And um, I'm just curious. Ms. Ewan's ready to answer that. Um, yes, this, yeah. uh, we do approve a 10-year plan, but the county and city only approve a five-year plan. So it's at this point after they approve their plan that you come back and adopt the five-year total. Thank you. Sorry, I don't remember that. Um, and then, uh, so this year, um, in fiscal year 21, rather, it's zero dollars. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, wow. Um, has that ever happened? Not that I can recall. So we're truly in uncharted charted territory for a capital improvement budget of zero next fiscal year. Um, okay, and then my other comment is that uh, I know things are upended because of the uh, pandemic, but I just want affirm that we absolutely need a 10th elementary school um, and that I just want to affirm that thank you miss cook mr. Kelly or dr. Um, Peters. mr. Kelly uh, yes yeah thank you uh, so we approve a five-year plan but they fund one year so we we, we still get to go back for uh, every year going forward to, to adjust that number um, and and I'm and I'm and to Mrs. Cook's point, the, the elementary has been pushed, uh, as, I, as I see it, out of this five-year plan. Yes, that is correct. And um, as Mrs. As I, I agree with Mrs. Cook, the, we need to we ha we still must affirm the need for that for that uh, elementary school and um, the, to uh, to un, un, unburden our elementary schools at the moment. So uh, I. I will, I will vote to support this. Uh, it's an interesting year, but uh, we, we need to keep the discussion of that elementary school on the forefront. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Dr. Beers? Uh, I, no, I don't have any comment. Mr. Dow? Thank you. Can you just uh, update us on the roof repair of Stonehouse Elementary? Was that, is that also pushed back? I believe that was funded in fiscal 20, so that... Um, that that repair is going on this summer, I believe, and should be done this year. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Hummel? Um, nothing other than, other than just reiterating the wow that um, Mrs. Cook said, because a zero amount in capital improvement means all the repairs that we typically do to save money later on aren't happening now, which increases our, I guess, our exposure for additional costs down the road. And so it's just, it is what it is, but it's, it is a wow. It'll, that's all I can say. We're, this is precedented, but. Yes, I, I see that we have a presentation. Is are we going to have it? Uh, if, if the chair wishes, we do have a, a few quick slides. If 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 needed, if not, sure, that's fine. Okay. 
Normally, we would be reviewing what was approved in the school board's capital improvement plan for the next fiscal year as it compares to what was funded by the city and county. But due to the COVID-19 pandemic, CIP projects for fiscal year 21 were put on hold and all projects have been shifted out one to two years in the plan. I will share what projects were within our fiscal year 21 request tonight and you have a document showing all projects within our five-year plan and where they have moved to. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, administration had made a recommendation that the Norge projects included in fiscal year 21 be funded from completed project balances as they totaled approximately 1.1 million and reduced our CIP request. This transfer has taken place, so these projects, which include a gym floor replacement, a partial refurbishment, and restroom updates have been funded. Refurbishment projects requested in fiscal year 21 that have been shifted into fiscal year 22 include a partial restroom refurbishment at Tawano, baseball field refurbishment at Berkeley, and a partial refurbishment of Warhill High School. Construction funds for the Warhill Auxiliary Gym have been moved to fiscal year 22, as well as renovation design funds for Lafayette. Fiscal year 21 would have been the first year of construction funding for the Berkeley HVAC replacement, which was proposed over three years. It is now shifted to fiscal years 22 through 24. The school board approved CIP included a request for funding of a new elementary school in fiscal year 21 for design and fiscal year 22 for construction. There was also a placeholder in fiscal year 26 for preschool space. The city and county have moved the new elementary school outside of the five-year plan and have included funding in fiscal years 23 and 24 for preschool space. The school board approved CIP for fiscal years 21 through 25 was requested for approximately $83.1 million and the localities have a plan that totals $67,628,000 for a difference of $15.5 million. The main difference in the five-year plan includes the shifting of preschool space moved into the five-year plan and the new elementary school moved outside of the five-year plan. In addition, the second year of the Stonehouse HVAC replacement, which totals approximately 5.1 million, was moved from fiscal year 24 to fiscal year 26. I would like to note that the shifting of projects to future years could potentially result in higher costs and the impact will be evaluated during future CIP budget cycles. Ms. Ewing, additional comments? Um, I would just like to echo again, um, the need for the 10th elementary school is real. Um, pushing this back um, just makes the need even more great. Um, so we have a motion on the table. Ms. Serza. Mrs. Young. Hi. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Mr. Dowell? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Elby? Aye. Moving on to item, item 8.4, personnel appointment book. Um, Ms. Young, would you move? Madam Chair, I move that we approve the personnel appointment book for fiscal year 2020 to 2021 as presented. I second. Thank you, Mr. Dowell. Any discussion? Mr. Kelly, Ms. Cook, Dr. Beers, any discussion or questions? Nothing for me. Ms. Cook, are you good? Yes, I'm fine. Thank you. I know further discussion, Ms. Serza. Ms. Cook. Aye. Mr. Dowell. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Ombi. Aye. Item 8.5, salary schedules. Ms. Cook, would you move that we approve those? Madam Chair, I move to approve the pay scales and classification book for fiscal year 2021. Thank you. Dr. Beers, would you like to second that? Yes, I'll second that. Thank you. Any discussion? From my colleagues on the phone? No, None for me. Hearing no further discussion, Ms. Serza? Mr. Dowell? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Ms. Zombie? Aye. 
Item 8.6, federal programs grant applications. Mr. Kelly, would you make that motion? Madam Chair, I move approval of the federal programs grants applications for the 2020-2021 school year to include the Title I, Title II, Title III, and Title IV federal program grant applications. Second. Thank you, Ms. Hummel and Mr. Kelly. Is discussion from my colleagues here with me? My colleagues on the phone? No. None from me. Okay, hearing no further discussion, Ms. Urza. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Mr. Dowell. Aye. Ms. Zombie. Hi. Item 8.7 VHSL membership applications. Mr. Dowell. Madam Chair, I move that we approve authorization for VHSL memberships for Jamestown, Lafayette, and Warhill High Schools for the 2020 2021 school year. Thank you. Dr. Beers, would you like to second that? Second that. Thank you. Any discussion? <laughs> Ms. Cook, Mr. Kelly, Dr. Beers, are you guys good? Yep. Good. Ms. Serza? Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Mr. Dowell? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Ms. Zombie? Aye. Item 8.8, .8, approved purchase request of laptops, insurance, and services for student use devices to Lenovo in the amount of $1,749,959. Mr. Kelly? Madam Chair, I move approval of the purchase request for laptops, insurance, and services for student use devices to the Lenovo in the amount of $1,749,959. Thank you. And Ms. Cook, would you like to second that? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Erza. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Mr. Dowell. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Zombie. Aye. Item 8.9, award a contract for invitation for bid number 20-14705, site work for classroom trailers at Stonehouse Elementary and Jamestown High School. Dr. Beers, would you like to move that? Oh, uh, I guess I, um, uh, I make I, I move that uh, the board award a contract at Henderson in the amount of one hundred sixty-eight thousand dollars. Ms. Young, would you like to second that? No. I second. Thank you, Mr. Dow. Uh, discussion. Madam Chair, I'd just like to say that I'm um, not going to be supporting this because I did not support the trailers as an ongoing cost that could take away from hiring employees. Um, and also because um, these are schools that are going to need trailers before we can build additional uh, classroom space. And so I'm concerned about the ability to add trailers at other schools who also will need it. So I will be, you know. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I also will not be supporting this because uh, I'm very concerned about the retention of jobs for our teachers. And, um, and although I do support extra classroom space for Stonehouse and Jamestown, I cannot support this, this motion. Thank you, Ms. Hill. Additional comments? Very none, Ms. Serza. Mrs. Young? No. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Cook? No. Mr. Dowell? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Zombie? Aye. Item um, 8.10, revise and rename policy JFC, areas of offense and their definitions to student conduct. Ms. Cook, would you like to move that? Um, I, I, I move to revise and rename policy JFC areas of offense and their definitions to student conduct. Second. Thank you. Any discussion from my colleagues here on the dais? Those phoning in? Hearing none, nope. Ms. Sir oh, wait, Mr. Kelly? Oh, no, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. All right. Ms. Serza? Mr. Dowell? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. 
Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Ms. Ombi. Aye. Item 8.11, revised, recode, and rename policy JFCG, possession or use of weapons prohibited to JFCD weapons in school. Mr. Dowell? I'm sure I move that we approve the revision, recoding, and renaming policy JFCJ, possession of use of weapons prohibited to JFCD weapons in school. Thank you. Mr. Kelly? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Second. Any discussion from those on the phone? No. Ms. Sarza? Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Mr. Dowell? Aye. Ms. Zombie? Aye. Item 8.12, retire policy JGD, student discipline reports of certain acts of parents, school officials, and police. Dr. Beers, would you like to move that? Sure. I <laughs> Uh, I move that we retire the, a policy JGD student discipline and reports of certain acts of parents, school officials, and police. Thank you. And Mr. Dow? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Serza. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Mr. Dowell? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Ms. Zombie? Aye. Item 8.13, Retire Policy JGE, Parent Responsibilities and Involvement. Ms. Cook? Madam Chair, I move that we retire Policy JGE, Parent Responsibilities and Involvement. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Serza? Mrs. Young? Mm. Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Mr. Dowell? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Ongby? Aye. Item 8.14, 2020-2021, Student Code of Conduct, Ms. Mrs. Hummel? I move that we approve the 2020-2021 Student Code of Conduct. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? <clears throat> Thanks again for all the hard work on that. Ms. Serza? Ms. Cook? Aye. Mr. Dowell? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Zombie? Aye. Okay. We're moving on to information items. Thank you, staff, for your patience. Um, we're moving, we're getting down there. So item 9.1, the 21st Century Career and Ready Advisory Committee Annual Report. So typically we would have the chair of the committee present that, um, but because of social distancing this year, we're asking board members to um, read it. And if you have questions, to reach out specifically to the chair of that committee. Um, I, did, I do have one question that I wonder if, if can, can staff can I ask the question, maybe staff can answer. Yes. Look, that's, okay, here's my question. When I read the report, I didn't see anything in there about the internship program that was started this year. I was wondering, will that be expanded? Is, are we not going to do anything with that next year? I believe the intention is to expand it. Um, Dr. Worley probably could answer that better than I can. Dr. Worley, want to come up? Ma'am, we do want to expand our internships, and we're currently trying to um, seek opportunities to build partnerships to, uh, to increase the number, but also to increase opportunity for virtual things in case COVID impacts what we're doing. We're, we're looking at all of that right now for career and college readiness. That's exciting. I guess, were there any other questions or, or feedback? My colleagues on the phone? Okay. No. Okay. Um, and then... Moving on to uh, 9.2, the Student Advisory Committee annual report. Um, again, uh, we can read that. We can reach out um, to uh, the chair of the committee or staff. I just want to say how important the Student Advisory Committee is because they are in the trenches and their feedback is invaluable. And so I appreciate um, all of their time that they give um, in meeting uh, the staff and, and giving us guidance. Yeah. Mr. Kelly? 
Yeah, Madam Chair, I was, I was really drawn to the discussion on vaping that they, I know uh, Mr. Dowell has brought that up a couple of times, and uh, they had some really good, uh, good thoughts on that, and it looks like they really put some thought into it. Um, they also had good discussion on the pre-Labor Day start, although I'm not sure that fall sports conditioning would start any earlier because I think that's dependent on the first game. But, but uh, it's, always, it's always good to hear uh, the thoughts of our students and what's on our students' mind. Yes, agreed. Additional comments? Ms. And, um, to, to me, that committee is, uh, is probably the most, um, I mean, when you go there, you just feel the vibrancy and the, you know, the excitement <clears throat> of our youth. And I saw several of the students who are on the, the SAC committee graduate this year. That was, and that was quite special to me to see that they're moving on. But um, I, I do appreciate this committee and their hard work. And I appreciate the, the staff that works with them and uh, comes up with ideas and Dr. Heron for, for meeting with them and getting their perspective. And I do think they have a unique, a unique perspective because they're, they're there with students. They're students themselves. So, to Ms. Young. Additional comments? Okay, and then 9.3, Special Education Advisory Committee Annual Report. Um, I just wanted to say I'm, I'm glad that the committee is still trying to uh, best define inclusion and what that looks like and looking at models uh, because it varies certainly across the country and even here within WJCC. And so um, inclusive practices um, are, are good for typically developing students as well as students with disabilities. Um, additional comments about that? Colleagues on the phone? Oh. Okay, and then um, item 9.4, return to learn overview for 2020-21. Mr. Walker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Walker is going to present some information to us tonight. As Mrs. Hummel said earlier, will we be coming to give information? This is the first presentation about what it might look like next year to come back to school. Um, we're calling it Return to Learn Forward WJCC Schools. We've just graduated l last week, and we're <laughs> literally starting to set the tone and the, the vision for next year. And uh, Mr. Walker, thank you for being here this evening. Good evening, Madam Chair, school board members, and Dr. Heron. Thank you for the opportunity to share a general overview regarding our work with Returning to Learn, known as Forward WJCC Schools which mirrors the state name known as Forward Virginia. The Virginia Department of Education's recently released document, Recover, Redesign, and Restart, acknowledges the importance of pausing, reflecting, and analyzing our work from March 13th to the end of the current academic school year before redesigning and restarting. So let's take a brief look in the rearview mirror. In response to the continued spread of coronavirus, March 13th, WJCC announced the closure of schools for March 16th through the 27th. Later on that same very day, March Friday the 13th, Governor Northam issued a statewide closure of public and private schools K through 12 effective the 16th through the 27th of March. WJCC students, though, were provided two weeks of printed packets of learning activities designed for review to keep students engaged with learning and to reinforce essential skills before that extended school closure began on March 16th. Then on March 23rd, Governor Northam issued a statewide order closing all public and private schools for the remainder of the academic year. A second set of learning packets were provided to WJCC students for March 30th through April 3rd to keep students engaged with learning. Following spring break, WJCC teachers began learning and planning for remote instruction and learning, while 1,122 loaner laptops were distributed to high school and elementary school students without a home computer before the remote instruction could begin on April 20th. And let's not forget that from March 16th through June 12th, WJCC staff has provided meals to students three days per week at four school sites, totaling 86,855 meals. Phase two, announced on June 5th by Governor Northam, lifted the stay-at-home order with a safer at-home strategy paired with continued recommendations for social distancing, teleworking, 
and wearing face coverings in indoor public settings. Phase three provides for the start of reopening our schools in the fall. Prior to entering phase two and phase three, all public and private schools are required to submit plans to the Virginia Department of Education as per an order of the Public Health Commissioner and the Code of Virginia. This graphic represents that information received from the Virginia Department of Health and CDC, state government, and the Virginia Department of Education is guiding our decision on how to reopen schools in the fall of 2020. Our instructional plan will include the following. As per the phases and recommended guidelines, opportunities for face-to-face -face instruction in school with health and safety mitigation strategies in place. For example, social distancing inside the school and on the school bus, daily self-monitoring and health checks, face coverings and or shields for staff, limits on the number of people in a group, specific cleaning protocols for high contact areas, isolation of symptomatic cases, and a continued emphasis on preventative hygiene measures, such as regular hand washing for employees and students. A blended format that could include alternating days and times in which students attend school with a combination of in-classroom and remote instruction paired with those same health and safety mitigation strategies while in school. And if the situation warrants, being prepared for complete remote instruction for all students at any given time, with the plan being WJCC students returning to learn anywhere. This graphic illustrates some of the work that is already happening in preparation for our return to school. As recommended by the VDOE, we formed our own Continuity for Learning Task Force focused on the overarching concept of learn anywhere through four foundational supports, devices for all students, equitable internet access, a digital platform, and professional learning. While there are many commonalities spanning grades K through 12, the task force is further delineated to include specific actions and differentiated work by level for elementary, middle, and high school. In fact, curriculum writing and instructional planning to support remote instruction and learning began today with a team of teachers from all levels paired with specialists and coordinators to start this work. WJCC Schools is completing a formal application for submission to the state by August 1st in order to receive allocated CARES Act ESSER funding for resources and needs as a result of the implications from COVID-19. Part of this total funding of $1.1 million is also accessible by the five local nonprofit private schools that have indicated their desire to participate on a submitted plan to WJCC schools. Preventative measures and mitigation strategies are infused within all aspects of returning to school. This is truly a team effort and we're thankful for the leadership of so many, but especially Mrs. Bourgeois' team and Mr. Snipes' team as we develop our division's health plans for phases two and three. Supplies cover a broad range of materials. To name just a few, disinfecting wipes, soap, face coverings, shields, disposable gloves, hand sanitizer, plexiglass installed in our main offices as seen in many of our local stores, outdoor Wi-Fi access points in school parking lots, portable Wi-Fi devices, social emotional supports and resources, and of course, the big ticket item, devices for all students in grades K through 12. We're collaborating on the many implications of social distancing requirements, which touch every imaginable component of our work, such as employees' work areas, students' learning areas, bus transportation to and from school, and how to serve breakfast and lunch to our students while adhering to these social distancing requirements. Expectations. Above all things, we value the health, safety, and well-being of our employees, students, and families so that all feel safe and comfortable returning to school to work and to learn. Therefore, several work groups comprised of various stakeholders are being created 
to build what this will look like for WJC schools as we return to learn. An integral part of redesigning and restarting school focuses on the importance of equity, specifically digital equity. Funding is needed in order to make this happen and move forward with becoming a one-to-one -one school division. And as you know, we've been working closely with the funding partners and even some community partners, such as the WJCC Education Foundation and the Williamsburg Regional Library to make these things happen. Due to all of this direct support, it's now becoming reality. Providing a device for each student with increased opportunities for internet access coupled with an interactive engaging platform for teachers to deliver aligned SOL instruction, to be able to store instructional content and resources, and having the ability for safe teacher to student connections and feedback are all necessary components when redesigning teaching and learning for returning to school this fall. Before moving forward with any reimagining and redesigning, we understand the importance of gathering feedback from our teachers and families. Recently, teachers were asked to provide feedback for what worked well and potential growth opportunities moving forward. Following the completion of all the graduation and end of year events, a parent survey will be sent very soon. The teacher survey and a recent teacher forum meeting revealed some important items that were successful and will be essential to future planning, as well as expressed needs. For example, we will continue with every K through 12 teacher having an electronic landing page through parent view and student view for consistency across the school division. An express need to continue with specific professional learning to support teachers' ability to provide quality remote instruction and learning came through very clearly. Weekly communication through the Friday newsletter to families and staff were also important in maintaining our connections and awareness during the closure. Kudos to Eileen's team on that. Another finding revealed that the direct support provided by our content coordinators and instructional technology paired with specialists and teacher leaders ensured consistency across the schools. These folks were working around the clock initially to create learning packets for students, and then it shifted to delivering professional learning and creating instructional plans to support teachers' delivery of remote teaching and learning. Additionally, Mr. Lander's team provided close to 1,000 remote and in-person tech support requests for employees and students. The support from curriculum instruction and instructional technology was absolutely essential for instructional consistency, supporting our staff, and continued success with our remote learning. So again, thank you for the opportunity to provide this very general overview with our start as we look forward to sharing regular updates with you, um, returning to learn forward WJCC schools. And at this time, I'm happy to address any questions. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Ms. Young? I just have to say that there's, obviously there's a lot of work that's already gone into this and an ongoing, because I know I've already been asked by parents uh, what was going to happen in the fall, and I told them to watch this presentation tonight. So <laughs> thank you for being, being here tonight and preparing for it. So. Sure. Sure, thank you. I, I'm also like really impressed with your PowerPoint skills. Oh, yeah, that's pretty <laughs> awesome. That's, I, I know that's the very least of all the things you've done, but I'm like, wow, that's really attractive. Um, I was particularly interested in the item number five, the task force. I think it's continuity for learning task force. Yes. Um, because I would like to see if we could build a really tight, perhaps, collaboration with William & Mary. They have the Studio for Teaching and Learning that I'm sure you're aware of and you have connections with. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we uh, at William & Mary have been going through this whole process. So you've got uh, a lot of, it's already been done by some mm -hmm. people that could perhaps be adjusted and, and be used 
for secondary schools, to at least the high schools. So anyway, I just wanted to throw that out and say if there were task force, how would someone, how would you choose different people to be on those task force that are, that have <coughs> expertise and, and are really committed to this community and the school system? Honestly, you know, with the release of the information that just came out last week, just the one document, over 100 plus pages, trying to assimilate all of that together from the different agencies nationally, um, state and locally, but coming together and then working, we've just initially started with forming some of these task, um, task groups and trying to get key stakeholders in there. So you bring up a really good point in making sure that we remain connected with those key stakeholders and William & Mary is a perfect opportunity. I'll, I'll throw something to you about that. Thank you, it's great, very impressive. And uh, thank you, thank you. Mr. Dow? Yeah, I, I do have a question, but I wanted to say thank you, Mr. Walker, and to everybody in this room for putting together this Return to Learn plan I know it wasn't an individual, it takes a team, a true team. And speaking as a parent, um, I've been looking forward to seeing this plan and seeing how you guys implement getting back to school for our, stu for our students, my children. Um, and I had no doubt that it would be fantastic. And I know that this is going to take uh, real uh, flexibility on the part of parents and, and teachers and a board uh, to, to see it implemented and, and done well and safely. Um, but I, I have no doubt that it will be. We, we just saw a fantastic graduation and events leading up to it that, you know, it took real creativity. And, uh, you know, I'm part of community and even parents like me have to wait and see what that creativity looks like. We can't, can't wait to see that. So I have every confidence in, in this staff and in you, Dr. Aaron, and getting us back to learning at whatever phase we can. Uh, my question is, uh, we, we've seen remote learning, and we've seen the challenge in assessing learning remotely. Uh, can you share your conversations about assessing learning if we had to go that route in that next school year? There have been several conversations about that. Um, it's difficult at some point when we can't ensure equitable access and trying to um, move forward with that piece. That's why we believe that the one-to-one -one initiative is so very important. And then supporting the work and framing it out so that teachers have the correct platform to be able to safely interact with the students and to be able to gather um, what I call formative feedback, not always necessarily that large sum of <clears throat> test at the end. Um, but I think that would be really important. That came out also in the teacher survey, um, especially at the elementary level, support also for small group learning and how do we do that remotely? Um, conversations beginning with that, but teachers said we need the professional learning. We need that continued support from curriculum instruction and instructional technology to make it happen. So we're, we're exploring it and trying to piece together, but we believe with specialist coordinators and our teacher leaders, we will be able to come together with something quality. Thank you. Mr. Dow, Dr. Beers, do you have comments or questions for Mr. Walker? Yeah, I, um, I, I guess the, the one question I have is, uh, relates to uh, the amount of change our students are going to face when they come back to school in the fall. And I'd like to know what kinds of support and time um, commitment to help students adjust to all of these changes. And they're going to range from transportation to academic changes um, to the delivery system of instruction. All of those things. Now, uh, it's not going to just be one thing. It's going to be a myriad of uh, changes. And I have used the word caution in the past, but uh, I'll set that aside and listen to how um, uh, you're going to build in 
the time and support to help students deal with these changes. I believe you know, one piece with the CARES Act ESSER funding, the application that we have to submit to the state to receive that money, social emotional supports and resources are acceptable expenditures on that. So we're looking at that. But something we've noticed as we reflected back from March 13th to the end of the current academic year, looking at the importance of teachers being able to connect with his or her students. And for instance, at the elementary level, seeing that through some type of electronic morning meeting, the value in the just the face-to-face -face and the interaction, um, very powerful. And we want to capitalize on that in a safe format. Um, moving forward and continuing to brainstorm ways that we can keep that human connection. And, and sometimes it may be virtually, we have to do that, but any way possible to keep the relationships and the connections. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Mr. Kelly? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first, I'd like to just kind of kind of go back uh, and just just congratulate the entire school system on the events of March, April, May, and now in June. Uh, you know, back in back in the middle of March, things were not changing on a week by week or even day by day basis. It was minute to minute, and um, the ability of the administration, you know, the administration to adapt and do all those packets, and our teachers to you know to start developing their, their uh, digital programming, um, the IT folks getting those loaner laptops out. I mean, all that was just was just incredible. The grab and go lunches to support support our kids. I, I think all that was great. Um, you know, I talked to some of the teachers that I've talked to. You know, they kind of the the whole digital learning was almost reinvigorated them and and you know got, got them kind of excited and it was it was just great to see. Um, so now that, now that we move into the you know this is this is a very general presentation and it's very general because the uh, the ink is barely dry on on the the governor's uh, return to learn guidance and uh, that is going to continue to develop as we go through the summer and um, I don't think it's going to change as often as it was doing in March but it's gonna it's gonna change and we're gonna have to adapt and we're gonna have to have to figure all that out so uh, you know as we sit here today um, the, we're still expect they're still telling us we're going to be doing SOLs. They're still telling us that we have attendance requirements, and there's still a lot of those kind of things that those requirements for us out there. And then we have to have a plan to meet that. But we're also going to have to have a plan to adapt if things change, if we if we see an outbreak, and if we have to if we have to go back. Some of the things I'd like to see us I'd like to see us really look at is Wi-Fi in the neighborhoods and. Um, not just in the in the schools and in the public libraries, but trying to trying to figure out a plan to get out there to get to uh, where we have concentrations of kids that we can go out and you know, I don't know if we have a Wi-Fi bus or uh, several of them that we can go park in neighborhoods to help to help them get online access for their uh, laptops and not have them have to come to a school or that kind of thing. Um, so uh, I just like to hear what's going to go on with the Bright Beginnings program with some of our some of our more needier kids. I don't expect any of that today because I know that we have we just we're just beginning to develop all that. Um, and then the other thing I do is look at look at the safety of our employees and how we're doing it. Are we going to are we going to test our employees or uh, uh, and you know kind of figure out. Uh, if they if they have antibodies or if there's if there's a method for doing that, um, and also I'd, I'd uh, you know some of the something that I think that one of the uh, public comments today about class rank and uh, you know looking at getting rid of that class rank thing I think that'd be a great thing to do too, um, at least for the the next year if not beyond that because uh, I don't know that that's really got its got the usefulness. So um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm hoping that. As things get better, we get more money. We have the, the we don't have the revenue shortfalls at the state, and that there's more money available. That our sales tax comes back, and that the uh, James City County and City of Williamsburg see their revenues grow as well to help support the uh, education. So, um, 
once again, thank you for this. I look forward to uh, more, beet, more meat that comes on the bones of the skeleton. So thank you much. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Ms. Cook? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I'd just um, like to follow up with Mr. Kelly's comment about class rankings. I, too, am intrigued by that um, and, you know, leave it to the experts to decide how best to approach that, if at all. But I, am, I do find it uh, an intriguing idea um, and hope that you'll take it, you know, under consideration. Um, and then, uh, Mr. Walker, one of the things you talked about, the support from central office staff to really make this work, um, reminded me of a, of a comment that I left off during the budget conversation, and that is, you know, we do hear from people occasionally um, that, that central office is too, too overstaffed, and, um, and I regret not um, talking about that. Um, you know, I don't, we don't, because of the way Virginia education is structured, we don't have apples to apples benchmarking um, across school divisions. But every time Dr. Heron has brought a position uh, in central office to us, or any administrative position, uh, a building based or central office based, uh, the benchmarking data has shown us to be significantly leaner than everybody else. And the last time that was studied statewide uh, was under the Warner administration. Uh, which, by the way, was the last time Virginia raised property taxes, I mean, uh, in, uh, individual uh, uh, income taxes, which I'll, that's a conversation for another day. But um, so uh, we are lean. We were lean then, and we haven't gotten, uh, we haven't increased much. Uh, so I just want to comment that our central office staff is very lean, incredibly hardworking, uh, and incredibly supportive of that, which goes on in the buildings. And, uh, and this is a fine example of that. So um, I just wanted to point that out. And then also, um, just for the sake of the public, uh, I know you're talking about going forward uh, and the plan uh, to, to get back to, to, to in the fall. Um, but, if you, but you started out your presentation looking back a little bit. And if you could just explain um, with a little bit of uh, depth to the public how successful your efforts were in reaching kids and how many kids you didn't reach, which really wasn't that many. I think the public would benefit from really hearing about how successful you guys were and making sure that you reached everybody. Yes, thank you for that question, Ms. Cook. Um, if I recall correctly, I believe at the elementary level, it was right around only 1% of our students that the schools and we're continuing up until the end trying to reach. Um, when you think about 1%, yes, we want 100%, but we were pleased that during this pandemic time that schools explored so many different avenues and opportunities, um, electronically taking grab bags and so forth, dropping things off um, in a driveway to a student in need, um, and at the high school and secondary level, I believe those percentages were very close to being similar to about 1% that we could not make contact with in any shape or form. Um, but schools continued right up to the very end trying to find where were those, the one percenters. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cook. Mr. Walker, I just have a couple things to build on um, that some of my colleagues have pointed out. Um, the issue of class rank um, that was brought up tonight by one of our um, citizens who called in, I, I think it might be worthwhile for staff to consider um, looking at a temporary suspension in light of COVID. It would be possible for you to consider that and report back um, in July what the possibility is. And if, and if that was possible, then spending an entire academic year on a long-term um, solution to class rank. Um, and then just wanted to echo too, um, with regard to central office, a lot of times folks in the community, you know, I've, comments that I've heard were just fire everyone in central office and keep all the teachers in the classrooms. And so we, we can't do that. And so at the graduation ceremony on Dog Street last week, a third grade teacher came up to me and, and talked about how important it was to have support from central office and all of the learning plans were created by staff and central office. And, um, and she said if it wasn't, it wasn't for that, she would not have been able to connect with her students and engage them in learning. And so we are mean and lean, and, but necessary. And so I just want to let the community know that, that folks in central office do a lot um, to support our um, staff in the buildings. And then um, I know this is an SBQ that I asked, and you may not have the answer to, but I just want to put this out there 
for the public to hear and maybe we'll, we'll have the answer um, in July. Um, I would like to know how many students who were, for all the students who were on track to graduate, did they? Were there students who, who were on track to graduate but did not? But I think, I think Dr. Worley's gonna come and answer it right now. I think the SBQ is completed, but Dr. Worley will provide the answer now. Okay, thanks Dr. Worley. We did complete the SBQ. There were a total of five students across all three schools for a variety of reasons. They were not all directly related to COVID. One was on the GED track, and so in the SBQ, there's details of that, but we had a total of five. Okay, so that's wonderful. So all the vast majority of students who were on track to graduate did, and there are mitigating circumstances for those who didn't. And then um, I just, um, if you could help remind me, Mr. Walker, the CARES Act funding that, that the schools can access, what is that dollar amount? $1.1 $1 million. And so, and now we have to share that with our five private schools, local private schools? We've had a, an initial meeting, and they have a time frame to submit their intent to participate um, by June 30th um, to me. And we will look at that piece and determine their proportional share as per a state formula. Um, rough estimates, if we had all five of the local private schools participate 100% based on their student enrollment, just under $100,000. Oh, so of that 1.1 million would go. Okay, so it's it's significant. Okay. Okay, and we'll know that by our July meeting. Mm -hmm. We'll know that. Um, and then I just wanted to stress to the public, and Mr. Kelly brought this up too. So obviously, we want to ensure that our students are safe um, with return to learning, but we also want to make sure that our staff are safe too. And and again, I've heard community citizens echo, "Well, COVID's not impacting children." That's what they say on TV. Um, but what we have are teachers and staff and administrators and people in the building. And so we need to make sure that everyone is safe. Um, and so while children are at the forefront of our thinking, we need to make sure everyone is, is safe and healthy. And then I um, was just curious about communicating to families. So as we begin to make this more firm, what's the process to communicate to families and what's about when and how and what? We're starting those conversations now and, and shifting with Eileen's team. Uh, phenomenal resources that were on the WJCC website with COVID-19 updates, newsletters, and now we're, our plan is to shift that a bit if Eileen wants to share. So as you know, we had a dedicated COVID-19 page um, throughout the pandemic, and now that will become more of an archived resource and you'll see a return to learn forward WJCC schools page being developed, um, laid out very similarly where it will have learning resources, it will have community resources, um, it will address some of those safety concerns. There'll be a section for employees linking to our uh, internal resources as well as external resources for the public. And then of course, along the way, each time there's an update here or also a development in the uh, the plan progress, we'll communicate that through our rapid notification system, through email, phone call, text message. Um, and we also have a, uh, a parent and family survey that we're working on now to uh, get feedback on the spring experience and also input on return to learn plans. That's wonderful. Thank you. And then I think just one kind of follow-up question to that. You want you to, I'm, I'm not sure who, stand, both of you stand there. So I know for a lot of our students, they're thinking of returning to school after Labor Day. Um, but for many of our high school students, um, they think about returning to school in August for sports, for band, or those kinds of things. And so when might we have information about um, like conditioning and practicing and those kinds of things? one of the very first task force yeah, go that are going to come, <laughs> um, that's coming together right now to, to address that piece. And Dr. Murphy and Dr. Worley um, are right now uh, that information. And that would be one of the first pieces of communication that would go out um, specifically to um, people who have expressed an interest in sports, band, previous participation, middle school participating in high school for the first time. Uh, so that we wouldn't wait until the entire plan is finalized. As pieces are developed, we'll share those um, both broadly and then specifically with people who have expressed an interest in that. That's wonderful. Thank you. And did you have something to add? Well, I just think that that's the right way to go. And uh, one of the things that 
uh, as I've talked to parents, one of the biggest concerns is communication. It sounds like you've got that piece in place and that's going to work. And I appreciate that. I, I just had an, an, another passing thought because uh, I know Mr. Kelly's uh, wife teaches first grade. And, 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 and so when you were talking about that social emotional thing, mm -hmm. that, that to me, we've got little kids that are gonna be trying to learn to read in the fall where they already, and they tried to learn this year. I'm very concerned. Uh, about what's going to happen with our early childhood education, especially the, the literary, the literacy. And uh, you know, it's a huge priority for me. I know Dr. Beers is greatly concerned about that also. So I think the, the more that we can communicate to parents about how that's going to operate, um, I think that would be really beneficial. But parents, you can read with your, your children every night for 15 minutes. Please do that. <laughs> Are there additional comments or questions for Mr. Walker? Are my colleagues on the phone? Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Thank Walker. Um, we're moving on to item 10.1, um, board member comments and requests. I will start with Mr. Dow. Uh, you know, I, I would just offer very briefly, because a lot's been said um, to the listening community. Um, I hope they're pleased with how their community has um, worked through friction to put, put together uh, hope for next year's uh, next year's learning, next year's school systems. Um, you know, we we had friction between board of supervisors, city council, school board, all because we want the same thing. We want what's best for this community, um, in in different ways. So, I am very optimistic now after today's meeting and conversations there's still a lot to be done um, there's still a lot to be answered and uh, but i'm a lot more optimistic about next year and about how we can continue to move forward uh, in our learning and uh, and uh, setting these students on the right path forward um, but there's a lot to be done still and uh, so i also wanted to thank our our funding partners for for making some hard decisions. Um, I want to thank those that called in today um, advocating for their children. That's the biggest piece for me is, especially when things are uncertain, um, stepping up, making your voice be heard, calling a neighbor, calling a, a, a peer that's in the same class, the French, for example, and saying, hey, let's let's make our voices heard. That's invaluable, so I appreciate it. Uh, and we'll need more of that, but we'll also need flexibility and understanding that things will not be perfect and they will be developing uh, in many instances on the spot um, as we seek to make sure everybody's returned safely. And I think most people in this room know that. For me, that's of utmost priority. And I think for everybody here on the dais and, and at home, safety is of utmost priority. So that's what I would have to add. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dow. Ms. Young? I just want to thank uh, Mr. Dow for his comments. I agree with those totally. Um, I'm appreciative of every, all the, the work that's been done to prepare for this meeting tonight. So I thank you for that. Um, I, I had another comment, but I have forgotten it. So I will just, just stop right now. OK, Ms. Cook? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, at first, I'd like to just thank Ms. Bourgeois and her team for putting together um, uh, graduation and the parades. Um, it was really a remarkable effort. And really thank all the staff uh, throughout the division that worked hard to create new ways to keep the same rituals for the kids uh, and for themselves. But just um, it was a very creative time, and I am just grateful to everyone for, for doing that um, because it wasn't easy on anyone. This, this has been a very challenging time, but people um, put the kids first, and I really appreciate that. Um, I also want to uh, echo um, Mr. Dow's comments about thanking uh, people who called in today, and se several people, because of the minute time frame, got cut off, so anyone who got cut off, Please email us your comments. We um, truly value hearing from people, and um, and I wanted to thank everyone who not only e uh, emailed and called um, and spoke uh, up to us, but also to city council and to the board of supervisors 
that kind of advocacy is critical um, and, uh, and really uh, lets everybody know how much uh, everyone in this community values public education and, um, and its quality. And we do, as Ms. Ombi uh, mentioned earlier, we have been, we're, uh, I believe, the largest uh, division in the state that's been accredited, accredited for as many years in a row as we have been. Um, and the bigger you get, the harder it is to do that. And the, uh, the more challenging your school population, the harder it is to do that. And we have done it uh, every year and want to continue to do that. And, um, and that requires um, investment. We have very high quality schools, with high quality staff, and, and I want to, to keep that. And, um, and so I'm hoping that we can uh, work together to con continue to invest uh, so that we have one of the best uh, divisions in the state and, and to keep it that way. Thank you, Ms. Cook. Dr. Beers? Yeah, we know from um, the words that we heard from parents uh, this evening and also ones we've heard in the past, not just from parents, from students, and, and many others that we haven't heard from, that students are anxious and parents are nervous. Um, the whole issue of can you catch up, um, you know, it's important not to fall behind. Change is coming and the planning is coming as well, uh, but it won't happen overnight, I don't think. Um, and, and I think uh, that it's really important to know uh, as well as what uh, teachers and the principals are gonna be doing um, is to really know what the counselors in all of our schools are doing in um, preparing plans and strategies to help those uh, students and their parents deal with this, um, uh, with these changes that are coming. I have no doubt that we have the support and expertise in our uh, staff and in our teachers to help our students move successfully through the school year next year. So I guess all I can really say is uh, fasten your seat belts, hang on tight, because uh, we're gonna really be in for a ride. Um, next year, and everybody is going to have to help, um, principals, teachers, parents, um, and their students as well. Thank you, Dr. Beers. Mr. Kelly? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted, um, one, one thing I want to do is I want to reiterate uh, the support for our school resource officers and the important service that they do for our students um, and the great asset that they are to our communities and uh, uh, really, really just kind of thank them for that. I'd also like to add my, my voice to the chorus on, for the thanks to the Jane City County Board of Supervisors and the City Council for the City of Williamsburg. Uh, we kind of all, we're kind of all getting through this together. Um, we, have, we have worked, what, what I believe we have worked well together. There might have been a couple of rough spots, but I think I think all three of the boards have, have really worked well together, and I think really think our staffs have all worked well together to, to address these issues and address the challenges that are coming forward um, from the unknown, the unknown of how what the effect on revenue is going to be and the effect on what our expenditures are going to look like. And I really want to want to thank those, those boards and their staffs for their great help. Um, once again, our central office, uh, all the work they did in preparing for tonight, all the work they did in working our budgets, um, the, the planning they did for the end of the year events, including graduations and the retirement events. Um, I, I just think, can't thank them enough for all of their good work. I can't thank our teachers enough for all the work that they did to, the, at the end of the school year, um, developing on the fly those the virtual learning and and uh, really, you know, doing what we doing everything that they could to to meet the needs of their students and reaching out in Zoom meetings and 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 really engaging with our students. I just want to thank thank everybody in in Williamsburg Jenkins City County School System for all the all the great work that they did. Um, I also want to thank all the citizens who got involved. A very constructive engagement uh, with us, with the city council, with the board of supervisors, even with some of our. Uh, our state elected officials, um, you know, the people who spoke tonight, people who spoke at the last meeting, um, the emails that we've had, uh, it's all been just very good constructive conversation, um, very much interested in what's, what's right for our, stu our students and 
I just want to appreciate everybody who's who's there. I'd also like to to, to send some th congratulations to our graduates. Um, you know, their their experience uh, for the end of the year, their experience in graduation wasn't necessarily the traditional graduation, but it doesn't mean it's any less momentous. It doesn't mean that it means any any less. Um, doesn't mean that it's any worse. It, it's it's different, and different can be good. Uh, two of the best graduation ceremonies I've been involved with under the school board both happened in Lynchburg for our, our some of our athletic teams that had to miss their graduation because of state championships. And I was able to to give the Lafayette baseball team their graduation, their their diplomas on the field after they won the state championship, and uh, and the Jamestown soccer team between the semis and the finals, and, and that was. That's one of the one of the really great um, graduation ceremonies that I've been a part of. Um, but the the other other event which I really um, hope that we can hope that we can do going forward, and it's one of my one of my most favorite every graduate uh, events that happens at the end of the year is the GED graduations. I really want to make sure that we're reaching out and recognizing those kids um, and the adults who have who have met that accomplishment. I think it's. I really, it's always our first graduation, and I think it's one of our, it's, you know, it's one of our most meaningful ones because those, those folks really worked hard to get there, and they could have quit at any time, but the resolve that they, that they showed in, in meeting that, and I really want to make sure that we're, we're recognizing those folks for their great work, too. So, uh, um, uh, once again, just thanks, thanks to everybody who, uh, who put together presentations tonight, and uh, I know it's been a long meeting, and I, I really appreciate all their good work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Ms. Hummel? Um, thanks to uh, my previous board members, I don't have a whole lot more to add. <laughs> I mean, other than to just say I agree with everything uh, everyone has said about their thanks, I, I would like to throw uh, an extra little uh, thanks out to Dr. Heron for her calm leadership throughout this entire uh, situation because it, it really does come from the top. And uh, I think you have a very measured approach where you, we, everyone knows you love the kids and you want what's best for our students and you advocate for them. And that leadership permeates the entire central office, all the teachers, the staff, everyone is motivated to do above and beyond what is the minimum, you know, like just going above and beyond with whatever they're facing at home with all their other struggles. They are um, really showing a lot of uh, strength and fortitude. And we're going to need it next year. It is not going away. This is going to be a long haul. Um, and so Whatever wonderful things we're doing now, we've got to keep up our spirits, and the leadership is going to be really crucial for that. So, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hummel. Here, here. Exactly. Yes, I have to echo the sentiment of all of my um, colleagues, and then just to build on what Ms. Hummel said, I, it, I, it warmed my heart when I watched the Board of Supervisors and City Council meetings to have their administrators and their staff um, speak so highly of our superintendent as well as our staff. And so I think that just speaks volumes, um, the level of respect um, that that is there. Um, have to congratulate our um, 2020 graduates and thank staff for all of the hard work that you did to create what I think was a really cool graduation. And I think we have created a, a new tradition, um, as people have alluded to, and everyone said it with um, the Duke of Gloucester um, Street Parade. So if there's any way we can continue that, there's something else to think about. But that was so fun. Um, and uh, I just, again, want to reach out and, and give a shout out to um, the community. And I, I think, you know, um, advocacy, as Ms. Cook spoke to, um, is so important. And, and what we experienced was a democratic process. Um, we all responded to a pandemic and uh, budget deficits, and uh, the community came together, and we shared our thoughts and opinions with the people that um, are important and make decisions. Um, and those are our funding partners, as, as well as our board. And so that's democracy. That's what it's all about. Um, Want to mm -hmm. thank all of our teachers and students and families for hanging in there. And now you get to take a wee break, just a wee break. And I know <laughs> some of our students are starting online learning tomorrow. I know two of my kids are doing virtual Virginia. 
8 a.m. tomorrow morning. And so some of our kids don't even really get a break. And then if we get to go back to sports in the band in August, they'll just keep on going. So um, get some rest tonight. And with that, I'm going to uh, move on to our upcoming meetings. July 14th is our scheduled next board meeting, and I'm fairly confident it's been determined tonight that it will be a virtual meeting um, because of social distancing. We're not able to, to um, have this space for Stryker, and the annex just isn't really big enough to accommodate what we need, and so we will be online again. Um, and so the closed session starts at 6 Five o'clock, and a work session will be at six thirty. So, unless there are additional comments, Madam Chair, Madam Chair, uh, I think we have a liaison meeting scheduled as well. Oh, that is the morning of. You're right. That's not on here. So that's the morning of. I don't remember what time. Yeah, that... Do you remember the time? Eight o'clock. Oh, it's at eight o'clock in the morning. Yes. Okay. We'll be there at 8 o'clock in the morning, and then we'll have a virtual meeting for one hour and fifteen minutes. It's one hour and fifteen minutes. Okay, tomorrow? No, that's on the 14th. Liaison oh, okay. is meeting the morning of our next board meeting. 14th. The okay. 14th. Yes, and maybe in August we'll have a face-to-face -face meeting. Hooray. All of it's not on the phone. I don't know. We'll see. So with that, this meeting is adjourned.